All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here for our city commissioner workshop, virtually, of course. And uh, we'll start off with a roll call. Mayor Brooke. Here. Vice Mayor Carter. Present. Commissioner Sarah. Present. Commissioner Vignola. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Simmons. Okay, he's not connected yet. Thank you. Okay, uh, if everyone would please join me in a moment of silence in regards to anything that's in your heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will go ahead with a Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, Commissioner Sarah, if you'd be kind enough to lead us in that, I'd appreciate it. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to flag of the United States, States of, America, of America and, and, and to, to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible, God. With liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for, all. For, all. for all. Thank you very much. John, good afternoon. If you would please share with us the virtual meeting state. Good afternoon, Mayor. Due to the ongoing state of emergency and as a result of COVID-19, this public meeting is being held using communications media technology in accordance with resolution 20-16 of the City Commission of the City of Coral Springs. The city has taken several measures to ensure that the requirements of 120.54 Florida statutes, as well as the spirit of the Florida Sunshine Law, are complied with during this time. Accordingly, this meeting is available for viewing live on several stations, Blue Stream Channel 725, 25, 25.7, and ATT UVerse Channel 99. Online, it's being streamed at www.coralsprings.org backslash city TV and can be heard live on city radio at 1670 a.m. For those individuals who may not have access to the meeting by any of these means, uh, they can watch it outside. If uh, they are so here, there's a television outside for them. There is no public comment today, uh, so there'll be no uh, call-ins or public comment uh, entertained as for all of our workshops, so nothing has changed there either. So Mayor, having said that, uh, it's your meeting. Great, uh, thank you very much. We have uh, set seven items on the revised agenda. Our first one actually looks like eight. Uh, our first one is an executive order update by you, John. Oh, Mayor, before we uh, get to the executive order update, uh, just have uh, a general uh, update prior to John getting into his uh, update, if that's okay. Sure. So Mayor, uh, good afternoon to Mayor uh, Commission. Uh, we have a full agenda tonight, so we'll get right into it. I wanna start off by giving an update as to where we are. And then the city attorney, uh, Hearn, will go through uh, and bring us all up to speed on the current orders affecting our community. Um, I wanted to give the commission in our community an update as to where we are with number of cases throughout the state and throughout our area. We have approximately 52,600 cases statewide with just over 2,300 uh, people that have succumbed to COVID-19. We have just over 9,600 hospitalizations statewide. Um, this is something we'll talk a little bit about because hospitalizations are on the rise in Southeast Florida a little bit. Um, we'll talk more about those. Statewide, we're averaging approximately uh, 750 new cases a day um, for the last week. Broward County, we have approximately 6,600 cases with just over 300 folks that have lost their lives and just over 1,400 hospitalizations in, South Florida, in uh, Broward County. Uh, we're averaging about 61 new cases per day over the last week. Um, that is up uh, a little bit from prior weeks. Coral Springs has approximately 267 cases currently. We're averaging about six new cases per day over the last week, which is again is up uh, prior to the last uh, couple weeks before this. Uh, the state of Florida is approaching the 1 million People, uh, marks for testing. Uh, so just under a million people have been tested in the state of Florida. The 5.6% uh, of those tested have tested positive over the totality of testing. For the last week, it's just over 2% of those that have been tested in the last week are coming back positive. So what about a 2% positive rate currently? 
In Broward County, just under 100,000 people have been tested. And the average is 7% in totality over the, over the course of testing and just under 2% positive return for the last week. So we're just under 2% return rate at this point for positive. Our team will continue to watch the numbers and we'll keep uh, the community and the commission advised as to where we are with that. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about hospitals. What we're hearing from our colleagues uh, that some of the hospitals in Miami-Dade, Palm Beach County are at a slightly higher level of capacity over the last uh, two to three weeks. Um, and then as well, the hospitals in Broward, there's a slight uptick in, in COVID cases that are being seen. However, I want to, I, I really want to uh, drive this home. There is no capacity concerns or issues at this point, nor are there any projected to be at this point. Um, so all of our hospital partners are, are telling us they're well within their capacity and have additional capacity if needed. Um, so one of the things that we want to we, we continue to stress is testing. It's essential to know where we stand when it comes to our community and percentage of folks that are infected by COVID. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we were really not sure of or didn't have a good idea of were those asymptomatic patients. Folks that were walking around that were ill but didn't know it because they weren't showing any signs or symptoms. So um, by having testing available around the county in here in the city, we can better, we can obtain better numbers for us to monitor trends. Uh, so as far as testing goes, our employee testing program continues. Um, we have a next round of testing coming up in a couple of weeks. Our public testing site is up and running in partnership with the Florida Department of Health over at Mullins Hall. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about that, Mayor. Uh, I've had a couple questions on the testing site and I would love uh, to share with our public why Mullins Hall was picked and uh, I'll have Alex um, weigh in uh, if I miss anything or, or misspeak here. Um, our public testing site that is over at Mullins uh, was picked years ago as part of our emergency management planning process. So what we do is, is as a city, we go through planning processes for the uh, unthinkable. And none of us sitting here ever thought we were gonna go through a pandemic, but we did plan for it through emergency management. Um, the site was, uh, was picked years ago. Uh, the city had an existing agreement in place with the Department of Health that was signed years ago. Uh, we had plans in place on testing and treating during a pandemic that were agreed upon and, and put in process uh, along with this planning. Due to the pre-planning process, the site was easy to get up and running in a quick and efficient manner. Um, so basically what happens is our emergency manager, our police department, our fire department, everybody goes out there. We look at different sites and we plan for different events, whether it's pods, points of distribution, or it's testing sites or it's treatment sites, depending on a, uh, a pandemic or, uh, or some other type of a situation where we have to treat large amounts of, of our residents. It's because it's centrally located, has the infrastructure, has bathrooms. Uh, there's no need for tents because we have the proper facilities there, has good access and has proper levels of security that this site was, uh, was, was picked um, during the planning process. As a city, we decided to go with an appointment only, not, a, not appointment only, but an appointment model. So we didn't have cars stacked up and waiting. Um, so uh, as, as to limit the number of people at the site at any one time. So there's, there's, uh, there's usually no more than 20 to 25 people at the site, including workers uh, at one time. Uh, Lynn and her team are gonna work with our uh, director of emergency management to uh, help put information out to the public to let them know kind of what happens out at there. And we look to further educate our public. Um, the one thing I do want to ensure our folks, it is safe. Uh, the site is decontaminate, decontaminated on a regular basis. The testing itself is performed outdoors. It's not done in Mullins Hall. Uh, and the cleanliness and sanitation of the site is being overseen by the Florida Department of Health. So they have approved all practices that are in place. Um, uh, some other questions we got were what happens when the parks fully reopen? 
at that point we'll meet as an internal team and we'll adjust the hours as necessary to make sure that uh, the uh, activities happening at the park can be held in a safe manner. Um, the Department of Health will provide testing as long as the city wants it. Uh, they've indicated that this site is one of the better planned sites they've have opened. Uh, it's been very uh, uh, user friendly for them. Um, and the cost of running this site is minimal because, again, all the infrastructure is in place and we're partnered with the Department of Health. And this is a great asset to our community. Um, we currently have the Department of Health book through the end of June, and we will evaluate that decision and monitor the numbers to see if testing will continue beyond that. Uh, the city has marketed this site. We will continue to market this site. Some of the feedback we've received from the community is that our folks thought you needed a doctor's note or symptoms to go to the site. That is not the case. Uh, you do not need a doctor's note. You do not need symptoms. All you need to do is pre-register, get an appointment, and you can go get tested. The capacity of the site is about 250 tests per day. Um, at this point, we, we have actually even haven't had a, uh, a, a person that has come through with symptoms. All of our patients or all of our, our residents that have come through have been asymptomatic and just wanted to get tested for, for, uh, for clarification for themselves. We will continue to work on testing. We're looking at some other avenues for testing to enhance access for the public and our residents. Alex, would you like to add anything on uh, anything I just said as far as testing goes or um, um, anything along those lines? Yes, thank you, Frank. Um, just two points that I wanted to drive home for the commission. Um, first and foremost, you mentioned the pre-planning. This was a site that was selected uh, years ago. We, we actually re-upped our agreement with this back in 2016. So this that that plug and play was, was crucial because we already had the plans outlined. We already had the agreement signed. So we were able to get this site up and running very, very quickly. Um, and the second component with that is it's a significant savings to our residents here because Whereas other sites might require us to rent a lot of tent equipment, you know, barrels, traffic control devices, this site does not require that because it is a city owned site. So those two factors together, um, the, the ease of use and the savings to our resident were, uh, I think points that are, are, you know, points of clarification. Um, I will mention just so that it's on this call and, and we can all share the information, the phone number to register is 954-412. 7300. And all, all our residents need to do is call that number and they will be, uh, you know, they can select an appointment time that they can show up and get tested. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. And Mayor, I'll pause here uh, for a second in case uh, the, yourself or any of the commission has any uh, questions on, on the numbers or testing at this point for staff. Yeah, for me, I just, uh, I'm very grateful that you were able to make that happen. I think that's a great benefit for our residents. And even just knowing that it's there and that the invitation is made, I think can give our residents an extra layer of security. Uh, so I'll ask the vice mayor, Sean, anybody else, if you have any other comments or questions, you can just unmute yourself. I'll start with you, vice mayor. No, I have no questions. I think it was a good presentation and I am grateful that this was uh, well thought out well ahead of time. Thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Sarah. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, just great execution of the plan and Alex Falcone, just phenomenal job along with the rest of the team. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I don't see on my screen, uh, Joshua or Larry, are you here? Yeah. yeah. I am here by phone. Yeah, great. just okay. So Commissioner Simmons. Thank you to the city staff for continuing to uh, make sure we take care of people's health during this time, so thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Vignola. Are we getting separated out um, the numbers of positives coming out of the Coral Springs site, or are we just getting that along with all the other numbers for the county? So um, Alex can speak to that, but one of the things we will be able to get stats for Coral Springs, we will not be able to get individual information from my understanding. Is that correct, Alex? Yeah, that's, that's correct. We can see overall trends, Frank, but we're not going to get the, uh, the individual data. You know, that does remind me of a question I have, Frank and uh, Alex. Do you have direct- uh, Can I go back to that? 
you have direct contact with somebody at uh, the Department of Health. Yes, sir. Great. Commissioner Bignola, you have something else? Yeah, I'm not asking for when you individual data. I'm not talking about the individuals. I just want to clarify. I'm talking about for our testing site. Okay, you know, 200 people went through today, and we find out the next day those 200 people, five were positive. Are we getting any of that data from that specific site is what I'm looking for? Yeah, Frank, if I will, um, we're not going to get those numbers specifically from the site, so I'm not going to get a report back tomorrow that says we had 10 folks that tested positive. However, folks um, that test positive, we will get that information daily in the state report, and their numbers are uh, included based on their address. So whether or not they test positive at our testing site or they test positive at, at a private site, if they list Carl Springs as their address, we will see that those case numbers increasing uh, in the daily state report. And the, thank you. And the, the only other one thing I wanted to see, I wanted to see if we could have staff reach out to the uh, various sports leagues. I know that was a concern um, from the president of the sports league when uh, we had a meeting last week was um, the safety and the sanitation of that area. So if we can just follow back up with them just to give them a little peace of mind, they can share that with their, uh, their league members. I would really appreciate that. No problem. Um, Alex, can you please get with Rob Hunter to get all those contacts and, and set up uh, maybe a webinar for uh, all of the leadership of the sports league so we can share our plans and the, uh, the cleaning and sanitation uh, schedule with them as, as well as the uh, safety of the site? Absolutely. Thank you. Mayor, uh, the next part I want to talk to is, is we're going to continue on parks here for a second. We've had okay. some issues. Right. We've had Good some... Uh, issues with travel teams primary uh travel teams primarily in our parks our community has been really good um and, and following um the rules if you will uh but we have had some travel teams that have been showing up with large groups of people at our parks to have practices um and, and that's problematic uh it goes against uh some of the orders john is going to speak to us about in a minute here um it, it is a safety issue it is a health issue and uh, at this point, it, it's, it's being ignored. Um, so let's hypothetically say we did not have an emergency order in place right now. This would be against our regular city ordinance. Uh, if, if you had a sports team, they would have to pull a permit and they would have to reserve to, to, to use a field. And uh, they're not doing that. Um, they're just showing up and taking over the field. Um, so uh, um, we do have an emergency order in place. And that order is from Broward County, and the order is very clear that Broward County is not allowing organized or team sports to practice or play in any Broward County parks. Parks are passive use only per this order <clears throat> at this point. Uh, so our plan uh, with our police chief and our director of parks and recreation is to enforce the county order that is in place. Another option, and I don't, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to, I look forward to getting the input from the commission is we could close down all of our sports fields. Uh, however, we feel by doing that, uh, this would be a blanket approach and that would cause us to close amenities for the rest of our community that are enjoying these amenities. Uh, staff's not recommending that at this time. Uh, Chief Perry and, and, and uh, Rob Hunter have come up with a plan for uh, enforcement, working with, with John and his staff uh, to, uh, to look at that. So that is the only issue we're having in the parks right now. Other than that, the parks have been going very well. It's just, uh, you know, these, these teams are showing up unannounced uh, without proper permits or proper reservations uh, to use the fields. Um, so I didn't know if there's any uh, 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 questions on the com from the commission on that. Commissioner Vignola, any questions on that? you ask me yes yeah um i do have a question have we reached out to um any of the governing bodies for these travel teams if it's the same league i know every sports league and team they have a, a overall governing body and most of them have rules specifically where they can have, take a little bit more of a punitive action with the the individual teams or leagues if they're not abiding by the local emergency orders and things so I was just wondering if we had reached out to them or, or looked at that. 
Um, so, Larry, our, our intention is to send a letter to the uh, registered agent and the CEO of the organization that uh, we're having a particular issue with. Um, and so that letter will be, uh, this, this has been drafted and, and uh, will be finalized tomorrow. Um, and reminding him exactly what Frank uh, has, has, has articulated. The first issue is you need to have a permit. Second issue is it's a violation of the county um, ordinance, which will, which uh, order, which will go through a little bit later and been confirmed to be in violation. So that's our intention. Jenny, other questions, Thank Commissioner you. Vignola? I'm good. Thank you. Great. Anybody else from the team? Commissioner Simmons? Yes, I have a question. Thank you. Uh, Frank, um, for, if you, I, I just want to, I guess, clear this up. So the, I, I believe, or maybe I misread, I thought the governor stated that youth leagues or youth activities could begin again. Can you kind of elaborate on it a little bit more? Uh, cause I'm just trying to make sure I understand because I've also gotten questions about adult, I guess, adult league activities as well, or adult recreational activities as well. So, so um, the short answer to that is the, and we're going to go through this in a second. So I'll just very, very 30,000 feet. Uh, the county has the ability to be more restrictive and has um, their order is more restrictive. And they, it's only for passive park purposes and does not include uh, any uh, teams uh, uh, sports at all right now. So, and I'll go through the details of that, but um, that's where there's a lot of confusion. And that's why, um, during my presentation, I will try to uh, make it as straightforward and simple as it possibly can be, um, knowing that it can't be just, there, there's, it, it, by its nature, there's some ambiguity, but I think we're in a very good place. Uh, we can walk through that at, uh, as soon as we're done with this. Okay, anything else? All right, Sean, Thanks. Vice Mayor, no? Okay, very good. So, Thank Mayor, you. go ahead, Frank. Yeah, so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to evaluate where we are with all the orders. Uh, John's going to give a presentation on where we are with the current orders. The goal is to give clarity on the upwards of 50 orders that have been issued between the state, the county, and the city. The governor has orders. The county can be more restrictive, as John just said. The county has orders. The city can be more restrictive than the county. In the end, we want to make sure that we, we don't have businesses or folks out there that are closed that should be open. Uh, so John's team performed an audit of all the current orders and wants to, and is gonna give us clarity kind of as to where we stand. Uh, so uh, hopefully we're not as, uh, you know, hopefully we can, we can clear all of this up. So uh, John, turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Perfect timing for our workshop, appreciate yes. it. Nice segue. Um, there's a PowerPoint. I believe Matt is working on putting it up so everyone can see it. And right on time, right on cue. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, uh, the legal summary. As Frank said, uh, Frank and I spoke yesterday about this. And uh, believe it or not, um, as you see here, March 1st, 2020, as you know, Monday will be June 1st. So almost 90 days exactly, um, we are at a point here where, we, where this started. So March 1st, 2020 was Governor DeSantis' first emergency order establishing COVID response protocol and directing this to be a public health emergency. Since that time, the governor has issued a total of 33 emergency orders directly addressing COVID-19. The county has, has approximately 13, 14, and we have um, in the teens, we have, two, we have 17 emergency um, orders at one time or another. So what I'd like to do, and, and if we remember, um, we, for the first really two months, it was about slowly, or depending on your opinion, tightening what can be used, um, uh, what businesses could, could happen and what activities um, our, our residents could engage in. And uh, we got to the point where we had uh, safer at home, some called them stay at home, only for essential services, um, supermarkets, ph uh, markets, pharmacies, hospitals. And if you go to the next slide, on April 29th, so almost two months into the declaration of, of there being a COVID-19 emergency protocol, was kind of when it started 
to go the other way. And that's when the governor began what was termed phase one, uh, the state's safe, smart, step-by-step -step plan for Florida's recovery. And they, he issued, this was a uh, 20-112. This allowed restaurants, in-store retail and museums and libraries operating at, at a much lower capacity, 25% capacity, expressly excluded South Florida, Palm Beach, Broward and Miami Dade counties um, in his, his press conferences and the frequently asked questions and said, there'll come a time that we'll get there. But right now um, he was not comfortable addressing that. The one section that did apply to us was section five, which allowed for elective medical procedures to resume. So basically for two thirds of what we've done so far, it was tightening, uh, uh, working on, on safer at home policies. Many, many orders were passed there. And in fact, if you look at the governor's orders alone are several hundred pages with exhibits. Then there were the, the county orders. And, and if you recall, part of our central uh, uh, businesses was actually the governor telling us to follow Miami-Dade County. So we really had a fourth layer of two counties uh, being involved. And so, as we all remember, there were a lot of opinions, a lot of questions about specific businesses and different opinions, even by the, the same uh, government entity, whether it be the governor's office or the county, because as they were moving forward, they were either tightening some of those opinions or loosening them up. Um, fortunately, um, we're at a, at a much simpler place as you'll see moving forward. So um, the next slide, please. Um, so then over that next month, so basically this past month, the state slowly expanded, allowing Palm Beach enter phase one on May 11th, also allowing for the rest of the state barbershops, cosmetology, uh, 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 and all, uh, they were authorized to open hair salons. Um, and a week later, um, allowing Broward and Dade counties to enter what's, what's called phase one. Um, and also there, the, was the, this was the governor's order now, he expanded restaurants, in-store retail museums to 50% and allowed gyms and professional sports venues on May 18th. However, again, um, South Florida, as we have been consistently with the governor's encouragement and with the county's encouragement because of the, the amount of tests that Frank just talked about is significantly larger in, in, in South Florida, we have lagged behind that. Um, and um, if you see May 22nd there, um, that's when uh, what Commissioner Simmons talked about too, al allowing organized youth activities, including youth sports leagues and teams. That was for the state. That was allowing counties and municipalities to be more restrictive. Uh, next slide, please. As you see, the governor's order set the minimum regulations. Um, and as I stated, cities and counties could be more restrictive. Um, so Broward County as well, their uh, emergency order 20-12, which opened up uh, uh, the restaurants and again, uh, uh, the uh, parks and, and uh, other, other businesses expressly allowed cities to impose stricter regulations. What the manager and I and, and, and staff in this commission have, have, have talked about in our Monday, Wednesday, Friday updates in particular is that we are not going to be more restrictive than the county um, along with the other cities through the county uh, attorney and the city attorneys and through the county manager and the, and, and the city managers. We have found a value if we could all have the same consistent orders. So um, we're following uh, the next slide. Um, the 20-12 was effective May 21st and shortly thereafter, um, uh, five days later was 20-13, which amended 20-12. So I wanna take these orders because these are the orders that are in play right now. These are the orders that although we could be more restrictive, anything here that says it's not allowed, there's nothing that we as a city can do under uh, chapter 252, the emergency, emergency management or um, um, statute, we have to abide by Broward County if they choose to preempt uh, the city. And what they have done is they have preempt us from being more liberal, allowing, allowing these uses that they've expressly prohibited, they would allow us to be more strict. 
again, we decided not to be. So the nice thing about this is, is, is there's a, it's simpler to look at from the point of there aren't that many businesses uh, that are uh, no longer allowed. And, and I certainly understand a lot of these businesses that are no longer, that are not, that are not allowed now would love to be allowed. Um, and that is really something that to an extent we work with the county, but the county's actually provided um, a, a, a number to reach out to them, which is 954-357-9500, um, not only for interpretations, but to also uh, listen to, to people's concerns. So what is not allowed as we, as we are sitting here today virtually Bars, uh, pubs, nightclubs, movie theaters, auditoriums, playhouses, bowling alleys, and arcades. Vacation rentals, except as authorized uh, by governor's order. And <clears throat> that basically when they say vacation rentals there, they're talking about uh, what's commonly uh, called Airbnbs, um, transient housing um, is not allowed by uh, uh, emergency, uh, executive order 20-87. Pools and hot tubs, unless otherwise allowed. So uh, pools and hot tubs are allowed if they are a, uh, operated uh, and owned by the governments and any government municipal county. Um, and also if uh, they are part of a hotel with social distancing or part of a, of a, of a, of a apartment or condo complex provided they uh, uh, again have social distancing and, and the cleaning and, and uh, as required that sanitiz sanitizing is done. Now there's some confusion and, and as we've seen, um, it, it, there's always a, a business that, that, that rises up to, 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 to the confusion. We, 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 we um, several weeks ago, it, it was pet grooming. If we all recall, we got a lot of uh, memos on that um, and certainly understanding the confusion, but the, uh, it was not allowed for a while, even though um, as a city, we, we would have allowed that based on what uh, other activities that were allowed. But again, we were preempted. Then there was the gyms and we worked hard uh, um, with the county on that. And, and, and now gyms are allowed. So you don't see that as a prohibited use. But massage parlors, um, and it's an interesting uh, um, term of art. We don't actually allow massage parlors, period. We allow uh, uh, what is licensed healthcare workers uh, massages. And that's you know, when you think of, of your businesses here, they are licensed healthcare workers uh, uh, um, uh, at, at what's considered a healthcare facility be, because they are licensed. Um, so if someone goes in there and it's for a health issue, um, that would be allowed. Um, but if it's a simply just a, a massage parlor and there's no medical issue at all, the county's not allowing that. Um, the uh, paramutual uh, facilities, except as authorized, it doesn't affect, uh, affect our city. Um, uh, next slide, please. So we can talk about that too. The tattoo parlors was one I missed, I apologize. So basically the tattoo parlors, massage parlors, bars, pubs, movie theaters, bowling alleys are the ones that right now are not allowed. Almost every other use is allowed right now based on the county. Um, now we've had, had an issue that we just talked about with parks. The governor and, and Commissioner Simmons brought it up. The governor um, did pass a executive order allowing for youth um, activities and team activities by youth in parks. The county ordinance expressly does not. Um, it actually um, says it's for passive use only and then gives some um, description of what that means, but it's specific, specifically does not allow team sports to be permitted. It allows tennis and pickleball, but actually limits it to two people on the court. So it does right now, it does not allow doubles pickleball or doubles tennis. It allows basketball as what they call an individual use. It will not allow pickup games. They will allow those familiar, the game, the game of horse, which is you have your own ball and you, and, and you shoot at a certain location and you can practice social distancing while you're doing that. It is expressly not allowing pickup basketball, is not allowing soccer, football, uh, baseball games. Um, it allows racquetball limited to one person at a time and it allows uh, obviously walking and, and running and, and, and they said it should be done one way if, if at all uh, possible. So 
this became a bit of an issue, as Frank said, um, and, and it, 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 it's an issue for two reasons. One, this travel team is not, um, uh, did not get a permit. They were taking up fields that was taken away from our citizens' ability to, uh, to enjoy the park um, and expressly in violation of the county order. And uh, we actually received an opinion and an email just confirming that from the county attorney's office uh, yesterday late afternoon. So that addresses the, the, the uh, park issue. So those two slides, uh, and, and, I, and I will email them uh, to all of you, uh, this slide and the one before are really the key slides to have because it walks you through what you can and can't do in the parks. And then it walks you through the, what is not allowed which is basically six bullet points. So it's, 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 these are two good ones for you to have. I certainly understand, um, and, and we've been speaking with them, if you have a tattoo parlor or, 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 or uh, if you're doing massages to a license, is that different than, than, than a hair salon? Uh, it, it's not us to decide that, it is us to work with the county, but once the county imposes it on us, um, you know, we, we, we uh, Again, to, for consistency and for the preempt, the fact that we are preempted, we we, we will um, advise people of what the law says. Um, the next slide. Um, so we actually um, have terminated all our orders that have been addressed by the county and/or the governor. Um, so as a result of that. We don't longer have a safer at home. The regulation on childcare facilities, the county is regulating. Closure of gyms and fitness centers, we're, 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 we're now open. The requirement for cloth facial coverings, we have repealed ours only, only to adopt the counties, uh, which does require uh, facial covering for all establishments with certain exceptions. And obviously our essential businesses order as well has been repealed. Uh, so we're enforcing the county orders uh, there are several orders uh, that are rather specific and, and, and that, that we continue to have in place in the very limited, um, and, and I have them on the next slide. So um, we have a, a, one of our first, actually our first order, uh, we did a declaration of emergency. So that was our first thing that we did, but it was a declaration um, which provided authorization for city manager to enter into these emergency orders. So our first one was for assisted living facilities and we've been very um, proactive with that. And I think it has paid off uh, a lot uh, for the city. Frank would have those numbers, but we are in there. We are communicating and, 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 and uh, fire and, and code and police and everyone else who's involved in that's done a great job helping us. So that's been very helpful. We wanna keep that one. The elimination of time delivery restrictions, we all recall, um, that if, if, if there is uh, um, food and, and, uh, and the shelves are able to be filled up quicker, we have uh, 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 do not enforce the, the, the timelines. We have not received any complaints about that that I'm aware of. And certainly I know um, getting, getting the, uh, the product into the grocery stores has been very, very important to us. The authority of the purchasing administrator to be able to move quickly when we're buying masks um, and other related stuff is 2020-03 is remains in place. The prohibition of price gouging remains in place. Um, our hearings before the special magistrate, as you know, and this may be something we'll look at in a, in a couple of weeks, but we are doing hearings that are of a time urgency. Um, and if it's not of a time urgency, we are continuing them, um, which does not prejudice the individual cited um, because they are not being given a final notice or, or fine unless and until the hearing occurs. So, so it also helps out our, our citizens that way. Um, the electronic, electronic submittal of bid packages is something that uh, obviously we, we, we want to, uh, part of our social distancing to, to keep in place. And our mobile food vendors is, is something that's only a few weeks old. Uh, so other than those seven, ordinance, uh, seven orders, all our other orders are no longer in effect because uh, they have been subsumed by, by the uh, governor's executive orders and the county's emergency orders. So I know it's very hard for, for the regular citizens because of 
uh, of the amount of orders that have come through. Uh, again, several hundred, hundred pages of orders have come from the governor and the county. Ours have been actually, I've counted ours, I think we have about 45 pages. Um, and again, almost all of those are, are now subsumed. So um, we continue to answer questions. We continue to get emails from this commission and, and uh, we continue to understand the frustration of people uh, who are in private business. And uh, we will continue to try to work with everybody, but we are under the the county uh, emergency orders and we're, and we're abiding by them and informing our, our citizens of them when, when we need to. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, very, very thorough, a lot of preparation, a lot of work. Uh, thank you and your team. Uh, I have a couple, then I'm gonna go to our team. Uh, one is in regards to the uh, facial coverings, so some frequently asked questions. I'm walking in my neighborhood. Do I need to wear a mask? No, the, the facial covering is uh, uh, applies to establishments. Um, it doesn't apply to walking outdoors. Um, um, social distancing, we want to have the social distancing. But if you're if you're walking your neighborhood, you're not required to have a have a have a face mask, facial covering. I'm, I'm here today at my law office at the walk. I go downstairs for a break. I sit on a, a bench. Do I need my facial cover? We're encouraging facial coverings. And when you're in the hallway of, of a business establishment, you should have that facial covering on. When you're sitting down at a bench, that you are not required to have a facial covering under, under the order. Gotcha. We'll go around the table. Uh, I'll start with you, Vice Mayor Carter, and then go to Sean, Sarah. Thank you, John. Thank you. I don't have any questions about the orders. Great. I wear a mask all the time. Except <laughs> <at> <laughs> That's safe. That's the safest way to be. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, Commissioner Sarah? I'm good as well, Mayor. Thank you. Great. Commissioner Simmons? All right. Thank you. Uh, John, so just one more time for the record. Uh, what are the legal ramifications if we were to um, do anything that ha the county has preempted us? So the under 252, the emergency management order, the county has the authority to preempt. Um, they have taken that authority to preempt us as far as the minimum requirements. So we would be in violation of that order. Uh, so in violation of that order, the individual who's violating the order, there could be ramifications for that individual. There could, there, there could be the county going in and asking for a cease and desist. The county ultimately could bring their code enforcement officers in to, to enforce it if we, if we refuse to. Um, they're all highly unlikely because, of, uh, meaning we're, we're unlikely to fly in the face of it. We had that issue with gyms and, and, and we worked with them and um, Frank, and his office um, and, and, and my office here have, have good relationships there, which can help us to the extent um, we, we, we would want it to be changed or we would want some, 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 some leeway. But in the end, until they change the order, we could not do anything different. Anything further, Commissioner Simmons? Yes, so I mean, I know that we're preempted, but what could, what, what steps could the county take? So again, they, they could they could go actually into the court, and and do a writ of mandamus or uh, or cease and desist a proactive one requiring us to do it. They could simply bring code enforcement, and and go into the business. And so, in this this was a little bit what what the concern was, and you, you heard it from the mayor in Fort Lauderdale. He decided not to tell the gyms to remain open once the county told them, um, as I understand it, it was reported that if you remain you tell your gym owners to remain open, we will go in there and we will do the citation and we will do a citation to the, to the amount of $15,000. That was what was reported in the Sun Sentinel. So he said, based on that, he didn't want to put them at risk. Um, and then of course, there's, some, there's funding out there that, that we are entitled to, 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 to request a share in. And I'm sure being a good partner is gonna help us uh, 
get the share of that funding. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have another question. So uh, I know that we have set up uh, a number for uh, people to call if they see any, I guess, violations of the restrictiveness of the code um, or the, I guess, the emergency orders. Uh, what, how are those complaints handled? So Christie's office has been has been dealing with uh, a lot of that. Uh, Christy, you want to pop on and, and tell us how you've been uh, handling those? Sure. So when we get the um, the reports in, they come directly to my email as well as two of my staff members. And so what we do is we forward them on to Jackie Foster in Code Compliance and to Brad McKean in PD, and then they go and send um, schedule a inspection where they send somebody out to go and visit the business and see if they are in fact um, non-compliant. Uh, and then of course they, uh, there's no fine issued or anything like that. It's more of an education process. This is what you need to be doing. Um, you know, they'll, they'll hand out the executive order um, and just make a record of it. And there will be a follow-up visit if they are found to be um, non-compliant. Right. Sounds good to me. Commissioner Simmons, any follow-up? Um, yeah, just one more. Thank you. Uh, do we have, uh, Frank or uh, John, do we have any idea as to why uh, tattoo shops are still, uh, do we know or are we just kind of just doing what the county is telling us to do? <laughs> I asked the question uh, specifically on a call with the county last week. And um, I wasn't really given a, a direct answer other than at this point, they're not looking really to adjust the orders until they get through this uh, first phase. I, I have I, uh, got the same answer from the county attorney's office. We meet every every Thursday, and I can I can uh, uh, bring it up again, saying it was brought up at, at my my workshop. I I actually I have a similar question. I believe a similar sentiment to Commissioner Simmons. Uh, to me, they they are licensed. If they weren't licensed, they couldn't operate in our city. I don't think they could operate in the county. And from my understanding, they do take every proper precaution and they actually have more training for safety than, you know, most other licensed professionals that are now uh, able to operate. And um, I, I, I would like to push uh, along those lines um, and, and have them either make a very clear distinction one way or the other. Uh, maybe it's the other and they would rethink uh, what their current, you know, met, what their current order is. Uh, back to you, Commissioner Simmons, for any follow-up. You're still muted. If if you had some follow-up. Okay, uh, Commissioner Vignola, anything from you? No, sorry, no follow-up. Dogs are barking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything from you, Commissioner Vignola? Oh, Mayor, give him a moment to unmute. Yeah, Mayor, before we start at the meeting, um, Commissioner Vignola did let us know that he's having some connection issues and some technical issues. So if he's called upon and doesn't answer, that may be why. Okay, sounds good. If he has questions later, uh, we'll let him come back on. Uh, anything further from you, John? No, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you know, again, I, I hope I don't sound too repetitive uh, I just think we have an unbelievable team at the top. I think we have an unbelievable team at the middle, uh, at the bottom, uh, really throughout our organization. And our, our city is in great hands with you guys running the show day to day and having such great team members. And uh, I feel very secure uh, where we are uh, despite the pandemic and despite the threats to us that you and we were doing everything that we can to keep our citizens safe and informed. Um, and we're making decisions based on facts. We're not making decisions based on any politics. Uh, back to you, Frank. Mayor, um, I'd like you to, uh, if you would, uh, take and jot down three things we need to talk about uh, prior to uh, commission communications at the end. We have staff, I know, anxiously awaiting to do some of their presentations. Sure, I got it. Uh, Ready? We need to talk about the June 3rd commission meeting. Uh, There's some graduations that morning, so we need to have that discussion. I believe a couple of commissioners have asked questions on that. Uh, we need to talk about the July 1st meeting. Uh, historically, if it's uh, 
that meeting has has sometimes been canceled historically uh so we need to talk about that and then we we are probably going to well we're going to have an additional workshop in june to discuss uh dispatch services uh as well as uh, the cornerstone project. So during our commission communications at the end, uh, I just want to make sure that we touch base on those three things. Great. I have it on the agenda. We'll be ready to cover that at the right time. Next thing I have on our agenda is a report on our economic recovery task force. Uh, Frank, is that something Christy's going to handle? Yes. Great. Thank you, Christy. All right. Good afternoon. Just going to wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Got nine more minutes for the afternoon. <laughs> I just made it. All right, so we created the Economic Recovery Task Force um, about a month or so ago. It's one of the best practices in disaster recovery for uh, economic development organizations. And it came out of uh, meetings that we were having weekly with the chamber and their leadership. So city staff involvement is myself, uh, Frank Babinick, the city manager, Alex Falcone, director of emergency management, city security and special events, Melissa Heller, Deputy City Manager, Catherine Gibbons, Director of Budget and Strategy, Kim Moskowitz, Director of Financial Services, and Lynn Marcel, Director of Communications and Marketing. Next slide. The purpose of the Economic Recovery Task Force is an information sharing body comprised of local stakeholders. Uh, they're both public and private sector partners. These stakeholders will meet to contribute their individual perspectives on industry conditions, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on the local business community. Conditions continue to rapidly change from a public health and regulatory perspective. So the task force will significantly contribute to a broader understanding of conditions impacting us locally, regionally, and nationally. The information gathered will allow staff to identify issues where the city can make a difference and then make informed recommendations on how to address opportunities and challenges within the city. So in addition to the uh, staff members that I had mentioned earlier, Mayor Brooke is a, a member of the task force as well. Uh, we also have Cindy Brief, the president and CEO of the Coral Springs Coconut Creek Regional Chamber of Commerce. The uh, chair of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Andrea Jacobs, who's also with Brodsky Jacobs. John Biggie, JB Management and Maintenance. Jeff Burnett, the manager of the Coral Square Mall. Ray Carballo with Blue Stream. Roy Gold from Cambridge Diagnostic Products. Hilton Goldstein with Hilton Software, Diane Harpus from Diane's Country Kitchen, Tim Hogan's with Florida Power and Light, Rick Langus from United Medco, Kevin O'Connor from Runyon's, uh, Tony Milan from Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, Bernie Moyle with Cal Vegas LTD and the Coral Springs uh, Country Club, George Nagy from Eastern Metal Supply, Wanda Garris from Cleveland Clinic, Giselle Rahal from AmeriCorporation, Michael Rahal from the AmeriCorporation, Ron Renzi from Wahlberg and Renzi, Alex Rudolph from TAP42, Kendra Salerno from Central State Bank, Jared Smith from Broward Health Coral Springs, and Barry Spiegel with American Max Investments. We also have three subcommittees representing retail, restaurants, and healthcare. Uh, they've been very helpful um, and informative to get some perspective from those industries. Next slide. So there's four goals to the task force. The first uh, goal one is to retain existing local businesses. Goal number two is to assist developing or recently established business. Goal three is to attract regional and out of state business. And finally, goal four to retain economic stimulus checks locally. Next slide. Goal one to retain existing local business. Uh, this goal seeks to address the needs of established Coral Springs businesses and the strategies outlined here work collectively to address these needs. We've discussed marketing and promotional campaigns, including signage, a temporary moratorium on outdoor tents for restaurants to expand their outdoor seating and their capacity, education on new protocols to operate safely, distribution of PPE and proper use information, and the connecting businesses to loans and grants programs. And I'll go into some detail on these later. Next slide, Matt. Goal number two was to assist um, developing or recently established businesses. And so this goal is to look on newly founded and developing businesses in the city. Uh, these organizations may have not had the same customer base and resources as a more established counterpart. Um, so we thought that we could introduce them to key city staff members from the city manager's office, from my office, development services, building department and communications and marketing. We would also uh, do all the other things we had mentioned under business retention, the marketing and promotional campaigns, the moratorium on tents, um, education on new protocols, 
the distribution of PPE, and of course, connect connecting businesses to grants and loans. So goal number three is to attract regional and out-of-state business. Uh, that's to continue building a competitive local economy aimed at attracting businesses. Uh, the EDO website does have an available property database that also is linked to some demographic information. And um, so we have that that we can utilize. We can also do targeted national marketing to site selectors. Um, that being said, this must be done in a delicate manner because industry-wide, um, if there's a disaster, you shouldn't go into another region and try to poach their business. So if we're dealing with site selectors, they've already been um, sought after by another business if we're looking to relocate or to expand. So it kind of eliminates that um, potential conflict. Next slide, Matt. And finally, we'd like to retain economic stimulus checks locally. And this is to ensure that any funds that they, um, anyone's received from the federal government or private resources stays in the local Coral Springs economy. So there's a buy local uh, PR campaign, I Love Local Coral Springs, that is done in partnership with the Chamber and the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. The Alliance is doing it with every city and they're gonna feature a different city. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's gonna be done every week, um, uh, but that is a campaign that we're definitely gonna be a part of. Next slide. So what have we been doing to help local businesses? Uh, so the Economic Recovery Task Force has developed, um, has developed to discuss strategies to help local businesses prepare for reopening connecting some of those businesses to goods and services and to ensure the recovery and sustainability of our local economy. We've discussed a connecting local businesses to grants and loans program, and that was uh, developed and launched to mitigate the effect of COVID-19 within the community by connecting these businesses to grants and loans at the federal and state low, uh, level. To date, over $800,000 has been awarded to local businesses. And over 43% of the businesses that returned their hold harmless to the city has um, received funding due to direct assistance from the city. And we're also going beyond the SBA loans and the state loans to identify other opportunities. Uh, Bradley Falcone has done an, uh, an amazing job doing this research, finding um, these grants that no one knew were available and it's been really helpful to our local businesses. In partnership with the Coral Springs Chamber of Commerce and Broward Health Coral Springs, we have distributed and we will be distributing 12,000 cloth masks along with safety information and hand sanitizer to local businesses for their employees so that they're safe and compliant. Uh, we have received over 250 requests and that uh, for reopen kits and that is has gone to over 2,500 businesses. We also are still taking requests. So you can go to coralspringsedo.com and submit your request there. We update them every single day and send code compliance out with those kits to deliver them. And if it is a home-based business, we are allowing that home-based business to come to City Hall to pick them up. We've discussed the Give Where You Live campaign in partnership with the Coral Springs Community Chest. And this is working with, um, to raise funds for temporary financial assistance for the Give Where You Live program. The goal is to raise money to directly assist uh, Coral Springs residents and local businesses through the application process. They've raised more than $12,000 to date and they are receiving the first applications. Three of those applications have been uh, recommended for awarding of funding. And finally, there's um, a new program that we've established. It's the Coral Springs Back in Business Grant Program. Uh, established a program to assist city businesses in the community by providing grant opportunities specifically designated to address the reopening needs during this unprecedented pandemic. The primary purpose of the program is to ensure that businesses are supported as we navigate the reopening process. Uh, this program came out of the task force. We had lots of discussions as to what we could do to assist. Um, a lot of the discussions surrounded the materials that are needed to reopen and the costs associated with those. Um, since businesses are already underwater at this point, any assistance is appreciated and will have an impact. We are looking for um, a grant of about $1,000 that will not have to be repaid. We heard from the business community that to take on more debt through a loan would be burdensome, and we certainly don't want to do that to anyone. Uh, we have uh, allocated $250,000 for the program from the Economic Development Incentive Fund. These funds will be used, uh, must be used for items that assist with a safe reopening, such as gloves, masks, plexiglass shields, sanitizer, et cetera. And the businesses must sign a letter of understanding certifying that they will spend the funds on items that are associated with uh, safe reopening. This item is gonna come before you at a future commission meeting for your review and discussion. Next slide, Matt. So in addition to what I just mentioned, um, we, we activated the business assistance hotline on March 20th. 
And I say we've received hundreds of phone calls, but I think that uh, the thousands is what it seems like. We answer the phone all day long. And it's been great to, to hear from the businesses, um, being able to relay the appropriate information to them, whether it's about reopening, safety, um, things of those nature. Uh, we've also sent out information on 24 separate occasions to local businesses, um, and that's also about safety, reopening, uh, things like that. The Coral Springs Police Department has lifted restrictions on parking enforcement and assisted with traffic planning for curbside pickup at local restaurants. They've also worked with businesses, which were deemed essential to ensure that no interruptions uh, existed to the operations. Communications and marketing has been engaging restaurant um, residents to uh, post their favorite local restaurants on social media. And we've also listed local restaurants offering to take out and delivery online. Communications as marketing have also created email communication campaigns directed to businesses registered with the city, uh, giving valuable updates on programming and funding opportunities. And they're researching the details of a plan for CDBG CV funding to be used for micro enterprise purposes. Um, They've also worked very closely with my office to put correspondence out to businesses uh, for PPE distribution and responding directly to local business needs. An example of that was today we got an email from a local business thanking us for the masks and the hand sanitizer. And she asked, do we have any signs available to put that, that masks are required when they enter her establishment? We didn't, and now we do. So we got that up and running almost immediately and those are out for distribution tomorrow. So the fact that we can turn that around uh, shows the amazingness of our communications and marketing team. Community Development Department has expanded their online submittals for planning and zoning, as well as for paint color applications. They've also allowed petitioners to email the Development Review com um, Committee for uh, submittals and plans. Building Department continued permit inspections for commercial business and coordinated with contractors to accept plans and blueprints for construction projects. And again, code compliance has been great in educating businesses about safety measures and distributing reopen kits that include that, that hand sanitizer, the masks, and our city reopen guide. So next slide, Matt. I'm going to close with a quick overview of the recently released unemployment numbers for the city, um, the county, and the state, and I'm comparing them against last year. So here are the state of Florida numbers. You see that uh, in April of 2020, about 9.4 million people in the labor force compared to 10.2 a year ago, uh, 8.2 employed now, 9.9 uh, .9 a year ago. The unemployed is 1.2 million uh, this year and unemployed last year was 338,000. So the state's unemployment numbers are now 12.9%. Uh, they were 3.3% in April of 2019. Broward County, uh, 935,000 in the labor force in April of 2020, uh, over a million in, in 2019. Uh, just under 800,000 are employed in 2020, um, almost a million in 2019. We've got 136,000 people unemployed in Broward County as opposed to 29,000 in 2019. And the unemployment rate is 14.5 and it was 2.8 in April of 2019. And the city numbers, our labor force is about 67,000. Uh, right now it was 73 last year. We've got over 57,000 people that are unemployed current, that are employed currently. Last year it was over 71,000. Unemployed in the city is uh, just under 10,000. Uh, last year it was about 1,900. And our unemployment rate has now gone up to 14.6. And in 2019, it was 2.6. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, are you back? I'm back, yes, thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, any questions or comments on Christy's presentation? Uh, yeah, the, I just have one question. I had a business owner contact me yesterday asking how they get on the city's website. And I was like, the city's website? Or you mean the economic development website? I said, please send me the link so I know what you're referring to. Have not received that yet, but do you know what he's talking about, Christy? I'm not, are they, uh, the only thing we really post on our website are properties. Um, so if they have a property within the city, a commercial property that is for sale or for lease, we post that. Um, if it's a restaurant, we have posted restaurants that are doing takeout, delivery and dine in. We haven't put the dine in yet, but we've done the takeout and delivery. That's also on our website. They can email me directly if they'd like, um, or they can also go on the Coral Springs EDO website, coralspringsedo.com. Okay. I'll find out what it is. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And Christy, is your email kbartlett at coralsprings.org? Yes, and Bartlett is with two T's, B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T. -T. Very good. Anything further, Vice Mayor? 
No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to you, Commissioner Simmons, and then Commissioner Sarah. Uh, I'm sorry, did we go in order? I apologize, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I'm asking if you have any comments or questions, uh, and then I'm going to Commissioner Sarah. Oh, oh, okay. Well, yes, I have one. Um, sorry, I don't know if, if I jumped out of turn. Um, just two questions, uh, Christy. Thank you so much. I know it's been a very challenging environment, and I know, uh, you know, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of businesses are hurting. Um, so for the the Economic Development Incentive Fund, what were those funds originally used for? It was a fund that was set aside for our QTI local match. Anytime a business qualifies for that program, there's a required 20% local match. We currently have several businesses that participate in that program. So this, uh, the funding will come from that. Okay, and you said it was $1,000 per, I guess, grant? Yes. Okay. And it's for, it will be for businesses between three and 50 employees. Three and 50 employees. Okay. No home-based businesses. No home-based businesses. Any other, any other thing? <laughs> any more, uh, I guess, requirements? You said- um, uh, They need to have a business base. tax receipt in the city. They can't have any open code cases. Okay. Open, okay. Now, what if those code, open code cases is something like really minor and maybe they were in the process of, you know, curing that? you know, before COVID or something like that. Is there anything where, anywhere business could work that out? I don't know if that's a John question, um, but I think if they're making uh, a goodwill effort and they've already tried to, um, to rectify the situation, I don't know if that would. So, you know, there's many ways to, to, to clear it out. You fix the violation, make the payment, come up, come up with a, uh, a number that we can agree to. You know, there, there are ways, Commissioner, but you know, the, the, the best way is to clear out that violation. And we're, and we're always open to work with people, especially if they are looking for a loan and they're willing to work on that code case, we'll help them resolve it. Okay. And then uh, Christy, for the application process, I guess what, you know, I guess what is the application process? It'll be an online only application process. It's pretty basic. We've created a form uh, that'll be uh, ready to go if this program is approved. Um, really just need your business name, um, how many employees you have, uh, your location. Um, we'll, we need to check up um, as to whether or not you have an active business tax receipt in the city. Uh, and then it will go through my office for, uh, for that type of vetting, just come directly to us and we'll reward on a first come first serve basis until funds are, are depleted. Okay, and I guess currently, um, you know, how many businesses do you think um, as I guess estimate that you could give a grant to right now. If we um, allocate the two hundred fifty thousand dollars with a thousand dollar grant, would be two hundred fifty businesses. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Sarah. Hey, Christy and your team for your thorough report. Um, question on the grants: Do you anticipate anything new or innovating? for the business owners coming from the federal state level down the road and to better support what's already in place? Or do you think that we're pretty much tapped out in that area? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I think everyone's hopeful that a program like that could come up again. Um, I know that there's been a couple counties in the state that have um, put aside funding for local businesses. So that's always an option as well. Um, but um, the state legislature, if they reconvene, uh, which they may have to do, uh, they could definitely put some programs together. Okay. And then one of the questions that was asked to me, and I didn't know the answer, was around the employee assistance grant uh, dollars that were awarded to local businesses, not necessarily in Coral Springs. But were, with that funding, were employees able to file for unemployment and receive that supplemental support, or was it one or the other? You know? I asked um, one of the members of the recovery task force, Kendra Salerno, about this because I wasn't quite sure if I understood the question. And she was a little confused as well. But, but she said that if a business, if you're uh, an employee and you decide not to go back and be rehired by that business, instead you want to stay on unemployment, then you would need to submit a letter to that business saying, I'm choosing to stay on unemployment and to not return to work so that the, the business is protected to show that they can still get their PPP and that they're not saying, okay, we didn't rehire this person. It was that person's choice to not go back to work. Okay. 
And then the last question, I mean, obviously with the unemployment rate going from like 2% in February to 14% in April, um, and I know you you and your team are getting out there to, you know, try to maintain the culture that, and the momentum we had going into the pandemic, but um, do you have any ideas or strategies um, in the upcoming months to, to try to, you know, support these businesses when it comes to the unemployment percentage? Or... Yeah, and I think that... Um... The chief economist for the Florida Chamber has spoken a lot on this, and he thinks that, that April and May are going to be um, where you'll see the highest spikes, and then we'll start seeing it return back to normal. And I think it will. I think a lot of our businesses be, and we're actually, we're lucky in the fact that we are not so tourism heavy, that we're going to see that huge impact. But I think tourism is going to be the, the industry that comes back the latest. So I think that we're lucky in, in that, that we do have a, a lot of industry diversity here. So I'm, I'm confident that our rate will come down. I think once the restaurants adjust to the new normal, they'll start rehiring. But I think this is also a really good opportunity for people to re-enter the workforce in perhaps a different industry that has a, a little bit more sustainability um, and some security. So I, I, I think that's a, a definite opportunity. And so we could certainly partner with Broward College, with FAU, and see if there's any programs that we could um, start advertising here and letting those people know that yes, you might be unemployed, but we have different opportunities. There's certainly grants that are available for them to return to school. And that would be wonderful. We saw additional funding that goes to something like that. Um, there's also career source that could help them post their resume. They do um, job training. And so there's those opportunities too. I think there's a lot of different things, you know, we can get creative. And usually when you see the unemployment rate go, um, go up, that's when you see enrollment in, in schools go up too. So this is, uh, you know, I think we'll definitely see that happen. And, and then the last question I have, thank you. The last question I have is, um, it seems to me in, in, in doing a little reading and, and listening to some interviews that some businesses, uh, despite the fact that we're going through an incredibly difficult and challenging time with the pandemic, have found that maybe the pro productivity has increased for some businesses based on their employee base being able to work out of home and so on. Do you anticipate this maybe being a problem for our city when it comes to um, office space rentals and, and ownership? I wish I could say that it's not gonna be a problem, but I think that it, I, I think we'll definitely see our vacancy rates go up for commercial. Um, people are realizing that they can work from home and that it doesn't impact productivity. And if your overhead can be a lot less because you have all your people working remotely, then I, I definitely think that's something that we're gonna see. So it might be that we're, you know, kind of like how we're taking the big box stores in a lot of cases and reimagining them as something else. I think that we could definitely see that for office as well. Are we, are we working on a potential plan or are you guys doing some uh, strategic, um, like, well, basically strategic planning towards the potential of that? We're tracking the, the vacancy rates. And the last time we checked, there wasn't a, a big vacancy rate for retail at this time. We would, didn't, hadn't checked the office right now because our, and then in the city, it's a little, um, a little difficult because we do have some, we have um, the financial plaza that's empty, but that did have uh, almost 100,000 square feet of office space. So that does kind of skew the number a bit. Um, we'll certainly look into it and see, you know, have we seen a difference? Do we see, uh, you know, and we'll reach out to some of our commercial brokers and say, are you seeing people that are saying, you know, we're not going to renew our lease? A lot of times you have a multi-year lease. So depending on where you're at within that, you may not be able to drop off immediately without taking a big hit. Uh, so we'll have to look into that. But I think if we can try, try to get a pulse as to what's happening right now, and if we're seeing people say, we're not going to renew our lease, um, or we're going to put our, our office on the market, uh, you know, I think we can definitely try to address it once we have a little bit more information. Uh, well, special thanks to you and our entire team to work with the businesses because um, we're going through some difficult times, but you guys are doing a great job getting out there and educating and comforting and trying to support. Them. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see Commissioner Vignola. If he wants to pop in, you know, he can pop in. I have a couple of questions uh, and one one primary comment and I'd like to see us take the lead in regards to the Buy Coral Springs campaign uh, and do it as soon as possible, not necessarily wait on the county, certainly work with the county uh, with helping us support local business. I've spoken with this, uh, about this with Frank quite a bit of time, um, you know, having studied velocity of money and uh, buying locally, I have no doubt that 
if we are uh, aggressive as a city, you know, we have what over a thousand employees. We touch a lot of volunteers. Uh, uh, we are an economic force. Uh, if we lead the way for a buy Coral Springs campaign and highlighting small businesses, the restaurants, the big businesses, whether they're chamber members or not, uh, I think that'll help insulate us quite a bit. Um, and who knows what we can do maybe with the Economic Recovery Task Force and with the idea of partnering with a local university like FAU or Nova Southeastern. Uh, one of the gentlemen on my kitchen cabinet is Seth Rand. Uh, he's a very innovative thinker. At our meeting yesterday, he talked about partnering with a local university or two uh, and kind of connecting young entrepreneurs with older entrepreneurs and seeing what we can do as a local economic force, maybe even in conjunction with Parkland. So those are ideas that I'd like to, uh, you know, kind of ruminate with you, Frank, on our call tomorrow. Uh, certainly share them with the Economic Recovery Task Force uh, and I kind of uh, catapult us sooner than later, because I think a lot of a potential further downturn in the economy is what's projected. Uh, a lot of insulating our local economy is what's projected. And if we kind of lead those projections, kind of like the prior commission did, was saying, hey, it may not be a popular decision, but we're going to, in a way, get downtown rolling because we're going to invest in this incredible city hall. So may not have been popular with everybody, but it was the right call. So uh, I, I'm looking for us to be similarly innovative and aggressive and taking the lead in a buy local campaign uh, that can really support our local economy and getting other members, you know, other small business owners and, and some other larger business owners like the Rahals, like Mr. Biggie, um, you know, engage in further conversation. What does that look like and how quickly can we support these small businesses even beyond what you have done already, which I think is, is great. So uh, it, this is not meant at a, as a criticism at all. It's meant as an invitation to further excellence to support our local economy. Um, so I don't know if you had any comments about what I just shared, Christy or Frank. Christy, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I mean, we always support local businesses. Um, we were gonna start in, Jan or in June to start reaching out to local restaurants so that we can sign them up for restaurant week, which isn't until October. So I think that's a good idea too, to start, you know, at least we're getting that outreach out there. And then of course we start our marketing beyond that. Um, our business excellence awards, we've been able to uh, advertise those um, local businesses that won. Um, and I also think that we'll be out there doing a lot of retention visits and posting them on social media and trying to let them know, like, this business is still right. open, they're operating, let's get out there and, and really encourage that. I also think within this CRA, there's a lot that we can do. Uh, we can't provide any financial assistance with CRA dollars, but we can look into having a, a promotional campaign. And that could be something as, um, you know, maybe we promote some type of outdoor sidewalk sale with social distancing, yeah. but some way to get people out into the downtown, walking around, interacting, seeing that all these places are still open and so that they can patron them. I, I would also like to invite our local businesses to share uh, best practices of what they've been able to do through this COVID crisis. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of businesses that have at least maintained, if not grown, I'd be interested to know what they've done to be innovative uh, through this economy and, and share that with other local business owners. And we've been working with communications and marketing to identify those types of businesses that have been able to pivot and make the best of a, a bad situation and those feel good stories that are out there so that we can help promote them as well. And we'll be working on awesome. that. Awesome, that's really great. So a couple more questions. A few weeks ago, there was a survey. I remember a 60% number. What was that number for? That I don't remember. We did a survey back when this all started to try to uh, just get a, a pinpoint to see where, you know, a snapshot in time where the businesses were, and had they kept on their employees, did they keep with their purchasing, and where did they see um, this, if they thought that they could survive um, recovery from this. So our hope was to get that baseline, and then now that we've kind of gone through this and we're starting to see the reopen is to go and send out another survey to see, like, right. how have you recovered so we can compare and contrast. Great. I, yeah, I'd like to get that survey out sooner than later and 
for us to learn those results sooner than later if you have the capacity to do that. I'll work with Lynn and her team to get that out. Great, great. Um, businesses that have just closed like Metro Diner, um, Sweet Tomatoes, I, I believe, you know, it's more corporate decisions, uh, but either way, uh, have you done and or can we do exit surveys of those businesses that we have lost and or about to lose for whatever the reasons may be to, to dive in a little bit? Absolutely. Um, we haven't been able to reach out and actually physically meet with them, which we normally would do is to do an in-person visit. But we can certainly reach out via email and see if they'll give us a, a response as to why they decided to close those locations. Great. I appreciate that. Um, I think that's all I had. Uh, anybody else? Anything? All right, Christy, uh, again, great job. Uh, thank you so much. We're very lucky to have you. Oh, thank we'll, you. We'll, uh, we'll go to the next item on the agenda. Next item, Mayor, is a financial update from Catherine Givens. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Last, last workshop in April, I gave a comprehensive update on projections for the financial impact within our current budget and began sharing initial assumptions for our 2021 budget formation. So what has changed or what have we learned in, within the last month? Um, what is typically expected, um, go to the next slide. What's typically expected, if you kind of look in that upper right hand corner, the expected route to go from A to B is a straight line. But what do we know that is not going to happen here? Uh, local economies and revenue sources vary and fluctuate um, among the states and counties and municipalities. Many moving parts and outcomes uh, we don't control. We didn't control when um, or when not to lift the closures, when closures happened. We were very reactive at that point. So that is part of the reason that cities will go through many different ways to get from A to C, let's say. Um, and that's uh, what we are seeing when, when we're calling people and we're calling um, peers and, and, and people. Uh, we, know, uh, we know that uncertainty is unavoidable. Um, you know, uh, no one has a crystal ball. Um, and so, so you can kind of see that we've, you can see the bullseye. And I, so I've included a target. Um, darts, the game of darts has many different variations. Clearly one is to hit the bullseye. Another cricket, you can, you can select where the number and what ring you want to hit. And this takes focus. It takes a deliberate stated area. And the next round you select again, perhaps um, you have a different set of circumstances. And that's what I'm continuing uh, to do is to state a range. If the assumptions are new information um, is given, I, I will then maneuver. So what have we heard? What have we, uh, what have we heard from our peers, other cities, webinars, the economists, um, my own intuition, the strategy really is to develop a forecast using reasonable assumptions and create a plan capable of responding to a range of potential outcomes. So that's what we're doing here. Um, so um, first off our financial sustainability and thoughtfulness and deliberate decisions to make, um, to save, move money to reserves, expanding and diver diversifying revenue sources and our update our financial policies while ensuring a positive financial five-year forecast has laid a solid foundation um, where it is not playing defense and we are within our financial sustainability. So we have a plan. What have we done? We've created assumptions. Again, I went and talked a lot about those assumptions in April. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of that memo and that information, but that's some of the assumptions are there. Formed an analysis off of it, reviewed our available fund balances. Uh, we've clearly already set up ourselves to have um, diversified revenue sources. And what did we do? We formed a balancing plan. Uh, we know that what I'm going to share in, in, in a slide or two ahead is we know that we're going to end in a deficit. We know we're not going to bring in the revenue. So what are we doing? We have a reduction of operation expenses in the current year that we're in. We have a plan for that within all the departments and they're falling um, in line with that. We have savings in personnel and benefits. I've talked about what mechanisms we're doing there. 
there's a capital save in, in our in capital. We have savings there. We've reviewed, reprioritized, repurposed the strategies there. And we know that we're going to be using some of our reserves that we got from Irma for this. So um, each component, I kind of breezed through that. So much work and sacrifice from the department has, has gone in. And a lot of thought has been made on our on our, on that plan. For the 2021 budget, we have created multiple scenarios. And you'll see this. Um, come the June 24th workshop. We'll really um, dive into what we're looking at within those ranges. So next slide. The year end projection for the general fund. Um, if you more or less look to the revenue side, um, you will see um, less revenue than expenditures. Our general fund has the expenditure and revenue they must equal at about 133 million. Um, you will see that that deficit that we're looking at is somewhere around uh, 4.4 million. I've always talked about needing a range that will be between possibly between four and eight million. Uh, forecasters encourage ranges as fluctuations and changes in the market uh, volatil uh, volatility are inevitable during this time. So if you think about $133 million budget and the fact that, okay, we're looking at a $4 million range, that's about 3%. Um, of the entire budget. So 3% um, is actually, if you look at it in that terms, it is a very tight window. Um, so it sounds large when you're saying, you know, four to 8 million, but it's a 3% margin of error. So um, that's where I believe the, that we will land. And we've kind of talked about what, what our, um, what we will be doing for, um, for continued um, uses of, of fund balance and things like that. Next slide. I'm going to speak quickly on this. This is more or less just to get ourselves um, accustomed to kind of what you've seen before in past budget uh, presentations. You know that we have, if we look at our revenues, we have ad valorem makes up about 45% of our um, of our revenues, which for this budget year, we have um, already received um, ad valorem and we'll continue on. So we know that that's going to take uh, be intact for this year. And next year, it's the following year that we're, we're looking to that, uh, possibly not being there. Our top eight revenues, that's where we have revenues at risk. Um, of our budget, we have um, about $41 million, and we know that we're not going to receive all of that. For charges for services and user fees, so we know that we have um, closed on some of our parks, City Hall and the Mall. Those are some of those revenue generators that we know that, that those, some of those revenues are going to be at risk in the current year as well as into next year. So um, more to come on next year with this, but this is very much in hand. When I looked at now, we've had one month of financials to see where what happened in March. Um, it very much tied closely to what we were forecasting um, almost spot on. So I do feel comfortable in our um, projections uh, to date. Next slide. So we also have a fire fund and in the fire fund uh, also look at the expenditures and look at the revenues. The revenues are the one that um, will not be coming in um, at the rate of uh, what we had adopted. And that is because we have a fire training academy that is a revenue generator. Now they have been, um, they had to uh, look at classes a little differently. And at that point that gave pause to some of those classes and revenues. However, that has now picked back up. Uh, we also have fire inspections, which um, had um, a revenue um, stall um, on inspections. We couldn't go and do um, all of that. However, we know that for the fire fund, um, we have a plan for that. Uh, we will continue to operate with no um, service level um, adjustments. They will continue to operate. Uh, we are just looking at some of the CIP and we've kind of had the good fortune on some of that to um, a grant did cover some of that. So that money will then go into fund balance and we'll use a little bit extra into fund balance. And at that point that fund will continue to be um, uh, a made whole uh, fund and we'll be able to continue to keep the 70% uh, reserve target in the fire fund. So those are the two funds that um, I wanted to give an update on. Um, Melissa will give an update on the museum. Next slide. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Beautiful. In the interest of time, I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, we're currently forecasting a deficit of $140,000 in the museum fund. Um, there is some fine print there towards the bottom of the slide. It assumes all positions, including the director, are filled uh, for the rest of the year. The general fund doesn't cover the $24,900 in electric bill settlement payments 
and assuming no emergency grant funding is received. Next slide, please. Now, the City Commission became the museum board and approved the settlement agreement with PFM because you believe strongly in the museum's important role in our community and you wanted to give the museum its best chance for survival. Uh, the revenue loss alone due to the COVID-19 closure includes Summer in the Studio, which is the museum's summer camp program, normally enrolls about 90 kids a week and generates approximately $100,000 in revenue. Evening and weekend classes for both youth and adults would have generated another $17,000. Facility rentals were budgeted at $14,000. We are planning virtual summer classes based on the results of a survey done earlier this month, and we'll be offering topics that require minimal materials such as comic book illustration, drawing techniques, and basic painting. We're hoping for $20,000 in revenue from six weeks of offering these classes. Bottom line here is that without people gathering and children attending camps and classes, the museum has little ability to generate revenue. Next slide, please. Um, for some perspective on the museum industry as a whole, uh, according to Art News, the oldest and most widely circulated art magazine in the world, most major US museums have said they will remain closed indefinitely. And as of late April, we're announcing layoffs and alterations in workers' schedules. Um, by the time Art News published the article referenced on the left slide of the slide, the Perez Art Museum Miami had already laid off 15 full-time workers, furloughed 54 part-timers, and instituted salary cuts for the remaining 49 employees. Now, the American Alliance of Museums is anticipating that nearly a third of museums that, haven't, that have closed won't reopen at all. The AAM publishes a Center for the Future of Museums blog. And about a month ago, the blog featured a column entitled, The Museum We Closed Won't Be the Museum We Reopen. This column said in part, quote, we will be smaller but more resilient, nimble and community aligned. We will look closer to home for content supporting artists in our backyards. We will focus on being safe, welcoming and inclusive of all. We will reopen and when we do, we will be different and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Next slide, please. The new staffing model described in the slide you're seeing will cover as much of the anticipated gap as we can without closing the museum entirely. It allows us to maintain revenue generating educational programming in hopes of bringing the gallery and other programmatic elements back when revenues are sufficient. But because revenue opportunities are so limited right now, we have no other way to close the gap than to reduce the museum staff costs. So at this point, we need you to weigh in on the financial part of this. Now, I've spent a lot of time working with the museum staff and they're an extraordinarily talented and passionate group of people. I have walked through the staffing model with them. The ability to res be responsive to changing public health needs and modifying programming appropriately will be very limited if we move to the staffing model, but the museum will continue to exist and will continue to evolve. If we do nothing tonight and continue with current staffing, the general fund will be subsidizing the museum this year, and that may be okay with you. But we've just heard is the general fund also has a gap to fill. So with that, I am asking for your thoughts. So, one of my thoughts um, is with our partnership with Bloomberg's Philanthropies uh, and our Power of Art program, I would certainly suggest that we look to any opportunity there uh, with any direct connections we have and any indirect connections we can develop uh, to seek some kind of grant for the uh, near future um, until things evolve. And I'd actually be surprised if there was no opportunity there, uh, given our relationship with them and given their commitment to help our community heal in light of the Marjorie Snowman Douglas tragedy 
and in light of the museum's integral par part of that role uh, subsequent to the tragedy. Uh, so that's my, that's my first thought. Uh, it's my second thought, it's my third thought. Uh, so have you reached out there yet? Yes. And what did they say? Um, the, we've talked to them about the challenges we're experiencing within the confines of the current grant. Um, we've talked about making sure that we recover as much of our um, administrative elements as we can within that grant as it was awarded. Um, we can, however, go back and make an additional ask um, directly speaking to you, what you've just suggested. I, I think that would be helpful. I, I mean, the worst I can say is no, uh, but my, my gut is they already have a vested interest in at least seeing uh, through this COVID crisis. And, and I'll tell you, uh, the philanthropies uh, weekly, I don't know if everybody knows this, uh, but they gather the Bloomberg Harvard mayors, uh, both this class, the last two classes, and they've invited other mayors across the country to get weekly COVID updates from uh, national experts. Last Thursday, we had uh, the... Um, um, Dr. Fauci on the call, and uh, it, he, they're, they're committed to cities across the country. I, I think they would want to ha at least explore the opportunity to help us. Uh, those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts. Uh, we'll, again, we'll go around the table uh, because I, I don't have you all kind of raising your hand. So we'll start with you, Vice Mayor, and then you, Commissioner Sarah, and then Commissioner Simmons. So I'm a little confused on businesses that can be open, businesses that cannot be open. Um, I went to Kohl's and Ross's today to return stuff I bought at the beginning of March and they were both open. So, and you know, counting the number of people that go in, the museum never has a lot of people in there except during those camps and schools. So not quite understanding why we can't have Maybe it's the county order, it's the governor's restriction, why museums can't be open. It's just ridiculous to me. You can have a mall open and stores open, but you can't have a museum open. And Vice Mayor, know. the museum can be open. Um, the problem is the location where the museum is, is in the Center for the Arts. And the infrastructure that surrounds the museum can't be open. All the employees that maintain that facility and kept that facility in condition of running have been laid off by PFM. So okay. it... it it's not that the museum can't open because of an order. It can't, it, it, where it is, is making it difficult for us to reopen it. Okay. All right. Melissa, would you agree with that statement? I would. Um, and I would also point out that the gallery is um, not a material revenue source. Okay. Um, the gallery helps, um, but the revenue driver is really that educational programming. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and right now, because of the executive order of the county, we couldn't have that educational aspect at the museum, or is it just the practicality uh, that, Frank, you were just talking about? So um, we are gaining clarity on camps. The governor has passed an order allowing camps to be hosted. Um, and uh, the county, we're, we're, we're actually gonna ask that question tomorrow. On, I have a meeting with all the city managers tomorrow. However, if we can host camps, we have to be able to do it in a safe and effective manner. Um, we're not 100% sure what that looks like at this point. Uh, I did challenge uh, Rob Hunter and staff to come up with, and our safety team uh, headed up by Chris Bader, to come up with what our recommendations for safely operating a camp would look like. And then we could take a look at that to see if it is uh, feasible for us to be able to do so. We do know some of the regulations in the past have been no more than 10 uh, kids in a room at a time wearing masks. Uh, you know, your hand washing stations and all of those types of things. The other thing is, is 
we're getting a little late into the game to be able to hire the folks needed to run the camps. So unfortunately, from a timing perspective, it's going to make it very difficult. However, we are looking into the feasibility and practicality of it. Um, I, I don't have all the answers for that today. I should have them by our commission meeting. Okay, I appreciate that. Back to you, Vice Mayor. Anything further? Um, I, I understand the, the difficulties about, you know, like you said, late in the game, but there's lots of people that are looking for work right now. So, I mean, outside of our process, I would think that we wouldn't have trouble finding people. It's not, it's, yeah, it's not finding them. It's, it's getting them processed and onboarded and okay. in place. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, on to you, Commissioner Sarah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, the vacant director position, what what is that salary amount? Uh, it is budgeted. The salary is about a hundred thousand uh, dollars, somewhere between ninety and a hundred, just for the salary. Okay, and that position's been vacant for a while, correct? A couple of months, yes. All right, and looking at uh, one of the recommendations was to fill that position. Is, is there a real need to fill it at this time or can we still be in a holding pattern? Part, part of the um, critical element that um, the team is missing is that leadership position um, and the experience that comes with holding that position. It qualifies you to hold that position um, and sits in that position where that is a professional that gives you advice um, on how to handle the museum's affairs. Um, frankly, not me. Um, so that position does need to be filled um, for sustainability purposes. Okay, and when we, um, as a commission, made the commitment to um, you know, bring this on as a, a city program. Were how many employees were onboarded pre-pandemic? Seven. Okay, and so the recommendation would be to go down to four. Yes, and let me say that we are right now at five full-time positions plus the vacant director. Uh, the seventh position was a financial position that performed um, accounting and payroll type functions um, that would be handled by the city's central finance department and budget office. So that person knew in advance they were not going to be coming over as part of the transition. Um, that person did stay on for a good period of time as a part-timer to complete audits and whatnot. So um, we currently have five full-time people on the books. And what's the cost savings with the, the shift in the employment model? Uh, I'm anticipating that it will cover the gap of $140,000. Okay, and is this consistent with how we're, because um, I know that we were not looking at any furloughs or any layoffs with any other city employees. My concern would be the inconsistency. I know that obviously the museum at this time is um, in need of our support, but I'm also looking at it from an employee standpoint too, especially if we onboarded them kind of pre-pandemic. I know that doesn't help make up the deficit, but I'm just looking at the human capital side. Do you do you anticipate going back to potentially the seven when things get whole again? Or is the idea to run the museum with just the four? Um, I would look to the new director for that guidance on um, how to run um, with what's needed to deliver the results that we're looking for. Um, right. I, 
we had hoped to spend some time and energy after the museum came over, really helping the museum to kind of optimize uh, and really uh, drive the efficiency of their operations by taking advantage of the core internal services that the city offers, human resources, budgeting, um, IT, uh, finance, the clerk's office. Um, there are aspects of all of those departments that have been performed by museum staff that would then be freed up to spend their time and energy doing the professional and museum and artistic things that we've hired them for. Um, and the hope was that that would really enable us to generate some more revenue to uh, function a little bit better, um, really help them, give them the chance to do what they're really good at and not have to worry about the business back end of it so much. Um, we didn't get that chance. Understood. I appreciate and respect that that um, your answer there. How I know that going into COVID nineteen, we had already started collecting resumes. How, how far in the process are we? To find um, we are down to a short list of less than ten. Um, they have um, submitted video screenings that um, have not yet been viewed by the panel. Um, and we could proceed with viewing those, ranking those candidates and with Skype interviews in fairly short order. What, what's your, your best guess is the best case scenario of having the new director of the museum on board? In the forecast, I put that salary starting on July 1. Okay, and then my last question is, um, and, and I, I appreciate um, the direct answers, I really do. Uh, as far as today, as far as the workshop and our input, are you looking for support on the model that is being suggested by staff when it comes to the employees? I have a fiscal responsibility, particularly as your former finance director, to say that this fund is in the negative. There is no fund balance available to defray the costs. If we do nothing, the general fund will by default pick up this cost. Um, there's a, there is a conversation that has to be had on whether or not that's okay. Um, the flip side of that is the general fund's already $5 million short. Um, looking at what the museum industry, and we're all new in the museum business, right? Um, looking at what the museum industry has done, many of the museums move very swiftly to modify their staffing um, to manage their costs. We obviously have not done that. And for the reasons you've cited, that's not the way we normally respond to this kind of thing. Um, but because they have no fund balance, I have to come to you and say, what, what are your thoughts? Are we willing to make choices to let something else in the general fund not be spent or done in order to help the museum? Um, and once again, I totally respect your, your answer there. And I appreciate your honesty. I guess where I'm struggling as a commissioner and just approaching my uh, year anniversary, you know, I voted to bring the museum on. We were committed to the staff that was working. I completely understand the economic side of it. I mean, that's black and white as far as I'm concerned. Um, but like our other employees that are within the city, um, we are very committed to trying to work every angle to keep everyone as whole as possible because everyone is really working more and harder than they've ever worked before. So, yeah, I just, I'm struggling just me personally talking to my colleagues now with um, the, 
the suggestion in the staffing model makes sense. It completely makes sense from a fiscal standpoint. I guess it's just my struggle is on the human capital side and transparency. And in full transparency, um, I will tell you, I talked the employees through it and that it was not an easy conversation to have. They do recognize that this type of thing is normal for their industry. Um, obviously that's a museum is not our core industry. Um, it's one we picked up for a number of really good reasons. Um, but I will say that I did look at models where some of the staff goes part-time um, or some of the staff goes part-time, a couple staff go part-time, the rest go down to family hours, which is a reduced schedule that we offer, um, which provides full benefits or close to full benefits for, um, and wages for only 30 hours of work. Um, and I will tell you the um, savings level um, did not come close to closing the gap on any of those other models. Um, Hey, Catherine um, was kind enough to work with me and uh, along with a couple of folks on her staff. So I'd like to thank her for all of the time she spent uh, trying to help me find another way. Um, but mathematically, this is unfortunately the only way it works. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's so, all I Sean, I, uh, Commissioner Sarah, I would like to say one thing. Um, this is not uh, consistent with with uh, how we're handling to answer your question. It's not. Uh, the second part of that is um, we did have some discussions uh, with regards to when we got a new director in place and if things were to start to kind of get back up and running that the employees that were uh, affected by this would be reached out to first. Um, and then I've also sitting here, uh, you know, listening to this, it's not a conversation that I, I want to have or, 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 you know, did not foresee, you know, I, I just don't want to have this conversation like you don't, you know, we don't want human capital. Um, but there may be some other opportunities through attrition to help uh, with those employees. Uh, there's nothing open at this point, but there may be something that comes open. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if it is the commission's desire and, and they, you know, and, and we get direction to say, no, that's not what we want to do. We need to find a way to cover the cost. Um, you know, like Melissa said, we will, we'll look elsewhere and we'll, we'll try to cover the cost, but we do want to make sure you guys have a complete and accurate picture of what's going on and then get your input and direction. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I just, I just want to make sure that we shook the tree as best we could make sure that there was no other options. Um, I agree with you on the human capital side, and I'm happy to hear that there'll be at least, um, you know, first call. If anything, Melissa, this is just more evidence that this hire is very, 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 very important um, because the museum before the pandemic and what it's going to look like in the future is going to be, in my opinion, completely different. So we definitely got to find that right uh, leader to take us to the next uh, you know, level. Thank you. Uh, next is Commissioner Sarah. I mean, I'm sorry, Commissioner Simmons. Thanks, Commissioner Sarah. No problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, it had been mentioned, um, M Melissa, you had said that uh, we'd have to look at general fund or anything like that. Have you all even taken a stab at possibly what are some things that, um, we wouldn't be able to fund or would have to kind of place on hold if we were to use that to cover, um, cover these employees. So um, Commissioner Simmons, we've looked at all of that for the $4.6 million shortfall. And this would, this would come out of, uh, out of reserves. I mean, there, there's no other place for it to come from because we've already shaken all of those trees, if you will, to get down to that 4.6 million shortfall at this point. Okay. Um, so obviously, um, you know, no one wants to discuss furloughing or, you know, laying off um, folks. Um, and so I had a couple of ideas. I mean, um, you know, like to me, social media is very important. I mean, I've always talked about how important social media is. And if we need 
to bring in revenue and things that we need to do for the museum. We, we're going to need our social media specialists. Um, I don't know if part time would cut it because I think we would need to be very aggressive uh, to kind of keep the museum up and rolling and, and kind of competing, you know, uh, for time and people's attention. Um, as far as the grant, the grant manager goes, I'm curious if the executive director, um, once we bring them on, uh, you know, for the time being, if they can work with our current, you know, city uh, grant manager to kind of look for those um, options or look for those grants or things like that. Is that something that's doable? Um, what I will say is uh, the museum funding is um, and kind of a thing unto itself. Um, Catherine, you, I know that, um, our current uh, grants manager, uh, Gabby, works very closely with Kristen um, in Catherine's shop. Um, uh, they pair together on a lot of things that they work on. Um, it is not a workload that can be absorbed elsewhere though. Um, the thought is that with um, the proposed part-time schedule that at least the um, regular operating grants that we have historically received, whether it's the state, the county, um, though, that those regular revenues we can work to secure um, and pursuing additional ones would have to kind of be put on the back burner um, to ensure that at least that little bit came in. Melissa, um, Commissioner Simmons, if I may, uh, this might help as well. Melissa, you mentioned that if we went to a part-time schedule and a family schedule, it wouldn't close the gap. How much of the gap does it close just so the commission knows uh, there, there might be a hybrid of options here? We're 140000 short. Now, if we went to that, what was the shortfall with that solution? I want to think it saved maybe twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. That's right. Yeah, I thought it would. I thought it brought us down close to a hundred thousand. It, it's not. It's definitely less than half. Okay. Um, because in that case, you're saving wages only. Right. Right. Sorry, Commissioner Simmons. I just want you to have that information as well. Okay. Thank you. So, what what would be the deadline? I guess for, I mean, obviously you would like to know today, uh, correct? Well, we're looking just for input and, and we're looking for where, where you guys, uh, where the commission kind of stands on this. And, and then, you know, we would come back with, uh, we would have to come back, I believe at a commission meeting for the, uh, for the actual guidance. Right. So, so the, the 140,000, that would just come straight, that would come out of their reserves, right? And that would be the only time that the museum would have to go into the, I guess if we were to, if the city were to um, fund, you know, that shortfall, obviously there's the four point, you know, um, million, but would that be like a one-time influx? I guess, if I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm at saying the right financial now that, that gets us to the end of the year. Commissioner Simmons, that gets us to through September. Through September. And, and then, then we, we go on to the new budget. And then go into the new budget and okay. And then even then we'd still probably have to make some tough choices. It's gonna be like that for a, a, a while. I gotta tell you, um, well, what were, what were I, I don't know if I heard it and maybe you I missed it, Melissa. What were some of the reactions from uh, staff when you went through this with them? I mean, I know you said that, um, you know, they know that it's kind of with the, the industry, but I'm just curious what would, what were just some of the general, I guess if you could give us the gist or the general feel. I will say that if the museum could run on passion and dedication, we would have the most well-funded museum in the free world. Mm -hmm. um, there are a group of folks that have banded together to pull off all kinds of events, um, to overcome all kinds of obstacles, including, you know, in the, after the way the whole um, art therapy thing came about for the students after Douglas was because the students happened to be in the building and were sitting there outside the museum waiting. 
um, to talk to law enforcement. Um, and the museum folks did what they do. And they said, well, here, come, come draw, come create some art while you wait. And they became a place of refuge. Um, that's what they do. Um, it was a heartbreaking conversation, quite honestly. Um, but, you know, we have to have the math conversation with you and that's what we're doing here today. Right. All right, and so this, this potential staff model change, this is for the foreseeable future. Is there a end date in mind or, you know, what, what, what are we looking at going forward? Is it, is it just through to September until we get to the next budget cycle or what? what, what? It would um, depend on revenue. Uh, the new director would be asked to um, do an evaluation um, look at what's on the table, look at what they think they need to do, what they need to do. Um, and we would take recommendations and move forward. But if this new staffing model um, is adopted this fiscal year, we would begin next fiscal year with this same model. Um, I think at this point, it's hard to say we could propose a, bu a budget for fiscal 21 with the current staffing level and the current revenue level. Um, I will tell you that, that there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there um, that is a challenge. And even though we seem to be on the horizon of summer camp starting, and we seem to be on the horizon of kids, you know, being able to go to a camp or some sort of summer activity that resembles normalcy, we don't know for sure if that's the case. Um, if that is the case or turns out to be the case, there will be far better financial results than we expect. But without those events, without those classes being able to be offered, um, it's a very hard to in good faith present you with a budget for next year that has the current level of staffing. Right. So, okay. So even if so even if we were to today as a commission say, um, you know, say we wanted to come out of the general fund, even though that's through September, then we're going into the new budget cycle, it pretty much would be coming back with the same kind of uh, solution or a solution that was presented today, correct? Not necessarily. Okay, because we might have some more revenue then, but the but it's not it's not it's not going to be rosy. Either way it goes, it's not going to be rosy. It we normally have a full year of classes and camps and days off from school. There are, you know, I mean, so there's lots of the museum's big fundraiser of the year. Brouhaha is typically in October. Mm -hmm. We are still social distancing and we are still not having uh, people in enclosed areas together. Um, that fundraiser is not going to happen. Right. So it, it's, it's that uncertainty that is creating the issue here. Right, right, right. Which of course, you know, that's why we're having this conversation. Um, okay, so what, what, I guess, what is the cut for, uh, or how much, I guess, what is the, so even if we go to this new staffing model, it's only saving the museum $30,000, right? So there'd still be $100,000 shortfall, correct? If I, if I understood correctly. This, this model closes the whole gap. Oh, it closes the entire gap. Yeah, the second model, Commissioner Simmons, that you heard was going to part-timers and going to family hours, uh, which is which would only uh, make up some around 35, you know, 30 to 40,000, depending on what the numbers shake out. But so, so the, the model that Melissa just presented closes the whole $140,000 gap. The incremental model that brings people to part time and family hours shaves about, let's say, thirty thousand dollars off of that hundred and forty. And then if we do nothing, it's one hundred and forty. So those are kind of the three options, if you will. And obviously, there's stuff always in between, but that's the examples. Okay. Um... 
And, and again, we don't we don't need a definitive answer right now. We, we wanted to present this information. We want to give you guys a chance to think about it. Um, staff is as we sit here, we're continuing to work on this, but this is we, we've worked on it. And this is the information we have as of right now. So we want to make sure you get, that the commission got this information. We could all brainstorm together and and see collectively what we could come up with. OK. All right. Well, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did Commissioner Vignola, did he get back on? I am here, sir. All right. Anything from you, Commissioner Vignola? Yeah, look, I, I um, you know, talks like this are not something that we're used to, to having in the city. Um, it seems like yesterday we were just bringing them uh, on board um, as part of the city. You know, um, the four and a half million dollar shortfalls would scare me. What exactly, and I don't know offhand the exact dollar amount, Melissa, you probably do know. What exactly do we have in the general fund reserve right now? I'm going to uh, defer to Catherine for an accurate answer on that. We have about 18 um, percent of what we uh, of what we need. So we have about um, hold on one second. I know I have this. It's about 25 million, uh, 25 in stabilization fund. Yeah, that's that's the concerning part for me. Is um, you know this year we're looking at four and a half million dollars. Um, we don't know what next year or the year after is gonna gonna look like um, with that volume following. Um, you know, I, I, Frank, I, I I know you and your staff are gonna sit there and, and do whatever you can. I know the mayor was talking about the Bloomberg, um, reaching out to them and see if there's anything you guys should do. I, I know you're not gonna move forward with this um, without going ahead and exhausting uh, every possible uh, avenue to to not have to do anything like layoffs. Um, However, um, if at the end, this is where you're at and you think this is the best way to go, I'm on board. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate that. So I have a, a few questions. Uh, my first one is what FEMA money is still owed to us uh, that we have yet to receive, that we are hoping to receive this fiscal year but we have not projected to receive it as part of our $4.5 million shortfall. We still are owed 4.2 um, million for Hurricane Irma. Now you, add, you added the statement saying how much we think we're gonna get at the end of this fiscal year. At that point, I don't know, that's coming from, that's coming from the state. Um, I can tell you that Alex Falcone has worked very hard um, and to get that, information um, to make sure that we have put everything into the system correctly. He's done so many times back over again of question and answer. And we've reached out, um, I think, as we told you, um, to our uh, our representatives at the state. So, Mayor, we had a meeting with Dan Daly last week and presented him with all the information. Um, and Dan has committed that he will work very hard on our behalf um, because you're you're going right down the road that we've talked about that and, and I said this on the call that money means the difference between maybe having to lay some people off and that that was exactly where my thought process is and was um, that money means a lot to us uh, we operate on a very tight budget we don't have a lot of fluff and you know as Catherine just stated you know we have 25 million dollars of reserves that one storm could wipe out that reserves uh, or just uh, the stabilization fund so um, we're hoping to, to hear something back, but we, we anticipate zero until we hear from the state. So uh, along similar lines of what Commissioner Sarah was talking about, you know, one of my uh, favorite things, Frank, that you've shared with us during this time is you are not looking to lay off one person uh, unless that's a last resort. Uh, and, and I love that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it shows the commitment that you and we have to our organization uh, and not just this department or that department, but every department. Um, and, I, and I believe you and, that's, and I think you have full support from the five of us that that should be a last resort regardless of what the department is, including the employees currently with the museum. 
Uh, so we have other avenues to explore and I'm glad we're having this discussion and, and you don't need a definitive answer from us right now. Uh, another reason I love it, it, it's not just a commitment that you have to our organization, Frank, it's a commitment that you have to our 130,000 residents. And I think uh, as the residents know and understand that commitment, they can feel that much more secure about their presence, uh, their being in our city, uh, being a resident and or being a business owner with that kind of commitment that also projects positivity and it's, it's realistic. Uh, and it, it's not, we can't say it's no resort, uh, but it's a last resort. So I, I appreciate that commitment uh, for everybody involved. Um, what I'd like to do now, Melissa, is if you or Matt can bring that slide back up. Uh, I wanna dig in a little bit more to the numbers. Okay. And while as you're doing that, Catherine, I just wanna make sure what shows up on that slide of the, um, the hundred, the, that dollar amount from the shortfall of the museum, that's not considered in the 4.5 million shortfall. That is not considered in um, the general funds. Okay. Now. So uh, thank you, Melissa and, and Matt. So you're showing estimated deficit of about 145,000 through, uh, through September 30th. Yes. Matt, what go back one. Project, what are we projecting as a deficit as of this month ending May 31st. Matt, click forward two slides. There you go. Um, we so what essentially yeah. kind of what I'm asking, Melissa, just to be clear, uh, and probably Catherine would have the answer, is what is our current variance? It's about $35,000 a month, Mayor. But I mean, right now, as of May 31st, going back to October 1, uh, what's our, do we have a current deficit? No, not okay. right now. We are our financials um, that we just had in April. Um, this is kind of that month that we're seeing the, the tip. Um, so no, currently no. Gotcha. So one of my suggestions is instead of looking at an executive director salary right away of 100,000, having not made that commitment to someone, uh, you may want to consider an 80,000 number and that's you know maybe ten thousand of the hundred forty one thousand shortfall, uh, not necessarily significant, uh, but certainly not a drop in the bucket. One of the things that I think about during this time is yeah, in a lot of ways it's it's an employer market, um, and not to say you don't want to pay somebody a fair wage. Uh, I think just the opposite. Uh, however. Uh, you want it to be fair both ways in this market. And when you look at 2.6% unemployment now to 14% here in our city, uh, what we might've been thinking about before for new hires, uh, maybe you think that, you know, rethink that uh, and that can save us money across the board. So that's just one of my thoughts along those lines. Mayor, before you move off of that thought, um, one of the things, go back on that slide, Matt. One of the things that is on that slide that I want to make sure clear, Melissa did mention it, but I want to make sure the commission caught it. There's $24,900 on their payable to the settlement agreement for the electricity bill to PFM. That happens, even if we were completely to shut down the museum tomorrow, we're still going to pay that from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the deficiencies of what we're looking at, it's 115, 116,000 which is operating uh, deficiencies. So that's, and I just wanna make sure that's clear to the commission because it's 24 nine we owe. And, and you know, there's nothing we can do about that. That's part of the settlement agreement that we have with PFM. So the general fund would have to pick that up either way because we're obligated to do so. Gotcha, okay. So I just wanna make that's, sure that was clear for the commission. And that's a good distinction, good reiteration. And, and in a way, you know, if we can focus more than 116,000, that may be an even better, you know, thing to chew on for anybody we're going out to for resources. So another thing I talked about a while back, and I'm not sure if I talked about it at a workshop, uh, I had talked about looking for a sponsor for the Center for the Arts. Uh, I, 
I still think we should do that maybe more so now than ever, uh, similar for the museum. And, you know, maybe Blue Stream, you know, wants to be the Blue Stream Museum of Art here in Coral Springs or whatever it might be. Uh, if you hadn't considered that before, Melissa, uh, I'd reach out to the larger businesses in Coral Springs, maybe look had they been a donor before to the museum, um, put it out for bids, uh, at least to put out feelers. Hey, if, this, if you could name the museum or, or be the underwriter for the museum over the next few years, what might that be worth? Uh, and pay up front uh, for that commitment. Uh, I, I think if there was a campaign, quote unquote, to save the museum, you could get $100,000. Uh, I'd, I'd probably donate a couple thousand myself just because the museum's so valuable to me uh, just as a regular community member, let alone you know, being the mayor uh, of the city. So uh, I think this is something we should you know, turn over every stone and whatever that looks like, ask for people to contribute. I feel the same way about our Give Where You Live campaign. To be frank with you, I could be a much better, much better promoter of both. Uh, Melissa, confirm for me in what we're projecting or Catherine, what we're projecting for revenues moving forward between June 1st and September 30th currently now is what? Nominal? 10, just, for, just for the museum? Just for the museum. Other than drawing down on grant funds that we have already had committed, um, yes. if we offer um, online classes, the revenue that we're expecting from that is um, $24,000. There is an offsetting cost um, for the part-time instructor salaries. Um, but other than that, that's, that's it for revenue. So of the 116,000 deficit outside of the contract, are you projecting revenue from the online classes or that's not part of the 116,000 you're projecting? That is part of it. Gotcha. That, that revenue is taken into account. Yeah, so, so I would want to engage in the former heavy hitters for the museum uh, the former board of directors who now hopefully they're ready to help us fundraise, whatever that looks like with a, a Zoom event, whatever it may be, and, and look for a fundraiser to you know, help a portion of it. Uh, I'd like us to not have to furlough any of the employees, uh, not just as a showing to the museum, but as a showing to our commitment to our entire organization and to the city. Um, and again, I think if we put word out that this is an area we're looking for community collaboration, uh, I think we'll find it. You know, and there are a couple of great stories we have in our community regarding community collaboration. Uh, one is regarding all the exchanges of resources that Shelley Sitan has been able to do over 50,000 matches. Another Amy Freedom Moret, she got about at least a thousand high school seniors to be adopted. You see all these parades. I mean, our, our community is resilient and especially because of the impact that the museum had on the healing of our community post, you know, the, the shooting at Mar Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, there gotta be ways. So I'm really glad you didn't need a definitive answer today, Frank. Uh, this is great discussion. It's important discussion. Um, and, and all of my colleagues had great comments and, and questions. So I just have maybe one or two more things. Um, so just so I'm clear in regards to the number, the actual dollar number we're projecting for revenue from June 1 to September 30th in total, including grants for the museum is what dollar amount? The total revenue for the year? Nope, just for the next four months, the last third of the year. All right, give me one second. I'm, do, I'm doing math live, which is always dangerous. Thank you.
Mayor, as Melissa gets that answer for us, um, we do, we have uh, uh, five items uh, still left on the agenda. Um, there are a couple that uh, we would definitely like to cover tonight. However, there are a couple on here that uh, can be pushed out. They're not time sensitive. Um, and then the presentations that are left that uh, we want to get through, we'll try to get through as, as uh, efficient as possible only because this meeting was scheduled till eight. And I know yeah. that, um, you know, some of the commission, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't want to speak for anybody, but I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. That's all. Melissa, you can actually get me that answer offline. We can move forward or get me the answer later in the meeting. You can text it to me, may trigger another idea for me. Uh, but along what you just said, Frank, uh, is the next item in the agenda important enough for us to keep on the agenda or do you want to take something out of order? So I think uh, Alex will be able to cover uh, e-permitting uh, pretty quickly. It's a, it is an amazing story. I think it's something that has bailed us out, uh, and and and, and uh, the the accomplishments here are definitely worth mentioning at this point. So, Alex, uh, I would ask that Alex just gives a, a quick update on that. Great. So, just before you go there, Alex, uh, Melissa, I believe Commissioner Sarah is now the new uh, liaison to the museum. Uh, he had great questions and great ideas. He's been involved in our community a long time. Uh, if he was open to it. I'd love for you guys to sit down and, and brainstorm with Commissioner Sarah some more. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And if you're if you're open to it, Commissioner, uh, if not, no worries. Uh, so, Alex, if you'll take it away about the e-permitting. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I like the picture in the background, that, Alex. Thanks. That's a great uh, the background. crew out at Station Forty Three took that last night at sunset. Great pictures on Twitter. So uh, I'll be giving a quick update on the progress and uh, accomplishments that city staff has made on e-permitting since October of last year. Next slide, please. So e-permitting was an action plan from our strategic workshop back in October of last year. Uh, at that time, our permitting software, eTrackIt, wasn't allowing customers to upload applications and plans. Uh, to our website. So the first step we had to do was to fix the e-track attachment issue. Next slide, please. And at the time, our customers only had three ways to apply for permitting, and, and none of them were paperless. Uh, customers could come into the building department, uh, or they can fax in their applications and plans to the building department, or they could send in an application by email, and, and none of these options were paperless. Uh, and we only had two permit types available uh, for for faxing and for uh, emailing, and they were AC changeouts and water heaters. Next slide, please. So by December of 2019, the track at vendor still had not fixed the uploading problem. Uh, so our IT department quickly stepped in, they went to work and they found the problem and fixed it. Uh, customers could begin uploading their plans. Uh, building staff started testing, writing procedures, training staff. Uh, we worked with, uh, we contacted Art Plumbing a local contractor, and we asked them to help us test our e-permitting procedure, and they were glad to help. Uh, our plan was to create, we, we planned to create two e-permit types and try to perfect the process and, and make it as easy as possible for our customers. Um, we didn't want to uh, frustrate them so they wouldn't come back and, and use the e-permitting again. Next slide, please. So we successfully processed the first e-permit on February 20th. Uh, so we added two more permit types and continued testing with, with art plumbing after that. Next slide, please. Our communications and marketing quickly created an e-permitting landing page uh, with how-to e-permitting tutorials, instructions for our customers. Uh, at the time, we, we had four permit types available for our customers. Next slide, please. So on March 13th, the building department limits its operations to prevent the spread of the COVID virus. We have a state of emergency. At the time, we still only had four e-permits created and successfully tested. So our IT department and building staff begin working night and day, literally, uh, to add more permits online. Uh, within a week, we had 15 of the most popular permits available electronically. We had five structural permits, roofs, windows, three electrical permits, uh, AC changeouts, five plumbing permits, including water heaters. Next slide, please. 
So the IT department and building staff continued working to add more and more e-permit types. And by April 2nd, 69 permit types are available online. That's 65 new permit types added in just 14 days. It's amazing. As cases of the COVID virus increase, the one-stop shop is forced to close temporarily as a safety precaution. Building and IT staff continue working hard to add more and more permits and we continue straining, uh, training staff and streamlining the process. Next slide, please. Building and IT staff create engineering and zoning permits to add to the list. On April 8th, 92 permits are available for online customers. Next slide, please. Since February 20th, Boeing Department has processed over 700 permits online. Two of the most popular permits we have are re-roofs, windows and doors, water heaters, and AC replacements. Next slide, please. The average plan review time for small permits before e-permitting was five to 10 days. We had the plans had to be reviewed one reviewer at a time and routed through the office. Some plans needed multiple disciplines. Uh, they had to be sent out to our drainage district, Broward County Environmental. Uh, our fire department had to review it, zoning had to review it, engineering, and it took time. Small permits are now being processed in one to two days and in all disciplines because of e-permitting, they're allowed to review the plans all at the same time. Next slide, please. So what's our next step? Uh, the building department and IT departments are working furiously on new software and hardware solutions for uh, online permitting so we can accept larger projects. Our goal is to accept applications and plans for Cornerstone completely online, 100% paperless, and issue the permit in half the time it would take to process paper. And that's all I have, thank you. Mayor, uh, I, I'd just like to commend Alex, his team, IT, everybody that worked on this. This was a game changer for us. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we were looking at possibly having to shut down a lot of the, the, the functions that the building department offered. And I think this was an amazing asset to our community to allow for this to continue. So I just want to say great job to all involved. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really phenomenal and great news for us and, uh, and great for everybody involved with the process. So uh, again, go around the table, any comments, thoughts, questions, starting with you, Vice Mayor Carter. Sorry. Um, I just want to say how impressed I am, how happy I am. When I ran in 2014, we were still submitting so many things by fax. I mean, even if I wanted to know how old a roof was, I had to submit a fax. We're so far past that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex, and your team. You guys did a phenomenal job. You thank you. Rock Great staff. Department. Yes, thank you. I just want to tell you how happy I am and how great you made this for realtors who need that information. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Uh, next, I'll call on Commissioner Vignola and then Commissioner Simmons. I think it's uh, all good stuff, and I'll share the uh, sentiments that I can. You were garbled, but I think you said it was awesome, right? Absolutely, Mayor. All right, awesome. <laughs> Great. Commissioner Simmons. Good work. Way to be innovative. As always, improving. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Commissioner Sarah. Alex, you had to you and your team. Great job. I'm putting a water heater in and my plumber said it, he was very happy, by the awesome. way. Very, Thank very you. happy. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And I'll tell you, uh, I'd say over the past six or eight weeks, uh, I've walked out every now and then with somebody coming out of having requested a permit and maybe four or five out of five uh, have said great experience. And some knew I was the mayor, some didn't know I was the mayor. So uh, great, great work and keep up the good job. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, thank team, you. for us as well. Thank you. Great. So next on the agenda is uh, Census 2020 results. Uh, can we go with that next, Frank? Yes, please. Great. Alex. The next Alex. Yeah, we got a slew of Alexes coming through tonight. Um, <laughs> so. Thank you guys. Uh, nice go ahead beer. And that up. Yeah, I actually took about a pound of hair off after yesterday. So uh, it's been about two months since I've been in the office. So I uh, appreciate, you, Alex. appreciate your uh, professional attire. Yeah, well, thank you for giving me a reason to get a tie on. It's uh, been some time. <laughs> I couldn't exactly find it. So. Um, 
we'll dive right in. I know we're kind of short on time, so if we can go to the first slide. Wanted to give you an update on what the census timeline activities are. Of course, COVID-19 has changed just about everything, so we'll go through them quickly. Uh, Broward County was able to resume the field offices. That was scheduled to start on June 1st, but we did get a head start on that by about two weeks, which is gonna turn out to be incredibly important. Those field offices are places where programs are planned and operations are based out of. So we do have two of them in Broward County, one's in Water Hill, one's in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so one of the things that they're doing right now is identifying the non-response areas. And they're also finding, uh, training those enumerators that are gonna go out and do the counting. So that goes into our next thing is that the non-response follow-up is gonna start on August 11th. That's the actual door knockers going out, speaking to people, getting uh, results from people that have not uh, completed their census. That's gonna run till October 31st, which will end the response period for census 2020. One of the reasons that it's great to have those offices up even sooner is that in-person group quarters counts are gonna start in July 1st. So these are very important things that we don't necessarily get to do on our own. So think of in-person group quarters are being as like dormitory living. And one of the very important things that they're gonna do here in Coral Springs is gonna be the count of our assisted living facilities. So that's gonna be a big bump for us there. Service-based counts and homeless outdoor homeless counts are temporarily on hold. Uh, those are two things that we'll work together with to get them back up and running. Transitory locations are scheduled for September 3rd. Uh, we don't have too many transitory locations here, but for what it would be for us are things like sober homes. Uh, it also includes like mobile home parks and long-term hotel stays. That's not gonna be much of a concern for us. The mobile questionnaire assistance was a new plan that the Census Bureau had put together where throughout the county, uh, people would come out and mobilely help people answer the questionnaire. So if we were to have events or gatherings or different types of things, that was gonna be a process that was available. Don't know if there's gonna to be too many events before October 31st, so there is no schedule for the mobile questionnaire. Finally, after the responses are taken, October 31st through April 30th will be the tabulation. So from there in that process, we'll find out how many representatives we get, what our funding is gonna be as far as the major programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are. All of those have to be delivered to the president by April 30th, and the president has two weeks to get it onto the Congress. So to touch on that, the process apportionment can be done prior to April 30th. It most likely won't be, but then there's two weeks for after the president receives it to get it to the Congress. So officially May 14th, um, April 30th, 2021, we'll have an official results. I will move on to the next slide and touch on how the results are going. So nationally, the, the country crossed 60% mark over the course of the holiday weekend. It sits at 60.1. Florida itself is at 57.6. Broward County is at 56. And Coral Springs is at 63.7%. All very good numbers for where we are in the time frame and considering everything going on. Uh, how are we faring against the other cities in the state? We are 74th of 409 cities total. That puts us inside of that top 20%. Uh, we are fourth out of the 22 cities that have 100,000 or more residents. Again, that puts us in that top 20% aspect. When it comes down to raw numbers, 26,473 of our households have completed their questionnaire. Uh, we have 41,560 households here in the city. We are looking to get to about 32,000 to meet our goal of 80%. So good job to the residents of Coral Springs for their response so far. We'll move on to the next slide and take a quick look at the top 10. So see uh, how everybody else is doing. I did have every city in Broward County on this, but it came out in size eight font and I didn't think anybody would be able to read it. So here we are, you can see we're in the top 10 ourselves in Miramar have been tied for eighth with Sea Ranch Lakes right behind us. Uh, Cooper City is not just leading the way in Broward County, they have the highest response rate in the state of Florida. So 77% is actual the max out rate. It's not just the best one in Broward County, it's the state. You see some of the other cities in there, you know, uh, Pembroke Pines has 172,000 residents and a 67.4% response rate. We have reached out to them to speak to what they're doing. Our efforts and theirs are virtually the same. So we have a good idea of what's going on there. The other thing to highlight is uh, the stars on there are cities that complete that 
formed a complete count committee. So seven out of the 10 did, uh, 19 out of the 31 did, did so countywide. So it's been an excellent program. A lot of times we're seeing the, the complete count committees are, are ranking up a little bit higher than the rest of the cities. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. One of the great things we can do right now is track our tracks. So we have 25 tracks within the city of Coral Springs. 24 of them are fully within the city. One of them is a partial track. Uh, of those 25, 24 tracks, seven of them have a response rate above 70%. 10 of them are above 60, or sorry, above 60%. And then the final seven are all above 55%. So we are hovering in that, in a pretty good spot where we have high responding tracks coming in with big numbers and our low responding tracks working ahead of where they were previously. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll take a look at some of the efforts that we've put in so far. Yeah. Uh, on April 17th, we cranked up a two week effort to target our lowest responding tracks. So one of the things that we did is we hit them with signs, with banners, with information, with phone call, with flyers in common areas. And we were able to see the increases in those tracks as they were 6.2, 6.4, 6.5, 6.6, .6, and 8.4. All of those were um, ahead of the city's average response rate for that time. That was a 5.4%. So we saw some areas increase you know, by over a full percentage point and then what happened at Forest Hills was over 3% uh, increased response rate there. So we did get a really positive effect off of that blitz. And I'll highlight some of the more things we're gonna do to track to help those low response areas going forward. So as we go to the next slide, basically what we've been up to for the last couple of months besides targeting those low response areas is getting up the entryway banners and neighborhood signs. PD's helped us by getting the sign board up. We've talked to uh, all of our complete count committee committee members and solicited information from them. Every principal and vice principal in Coral Springs got an email from me. We reached out to 51 houses of worship and 28 different property managers. 2,200 residents got a text message on census day. Um, Amy over in the clerk's office gave us an email list of 15 city boards and committees. We got emails out to all of them. We distributed a message to the clergy coalition, thanks to Monica and PD. Our newest hire in development services, Michelle, contacted 37 volunteer organizations. Uh, every car that came through for Feeding South Florida Food Drive got a flyer. That flyer had COVID information and census information that Christine over in marketing put together. Communications and marketing had press releases going out. We spoke to local unions. Uh, we got some census day shirts distributed out to our staff. I think I've seen just about every commissioner wearing one either at a food drive or on a virtual meeting. Uh, we got park signs out uh, the day before all the parks reopened. We got signs in at 30 parks. We uh, recruited and spoke with our influencers for Digital Action Weekend. And then some various organizations have been handing out some promotional items for us. Uh, big thanks to them. So if we go to the next one, uh, we'll take a look at some of the things that we have going on. So we're looking at doing a bit of a gift card surprise. Think similar to how PD uh, pulled some people over and gave them a little gift card. We're going to find some people out and about, get them to complete their census uh, online and award some gift cards there. Uh, faith Leader Lunch and Learn Series. We actually did get to do this with our Hispanic faith leaders, and we would like to expand that to our rabbis and our Haitian faith leaders as well. Indexing signs are going up. They might be up already. I'll have to double check on that one. If they're not up, they're going up. We're looking at some reopened business signage. So we're going to include some uh, window stickers and posters for reopening business packages. We're looking at developing an enumerator assistance program. So right now we're talking to the Census Bureau on whether or not we can provide some sort of support for our enumerators. Maybe it's a care package. That we get them, uh, you know, some sunscreen and a hat, some water, a water jug, something along those lines, or we provide them lunch on those on the days that they're working, something just to show that we're helping out with those guys and gals. Uh, we've been continuing our partnership with the county, particularly their complete count committees, by attending meetings virtually. Uh, we've been, we plan to meet with parents and school committees and figure out what's going on with back to school, if those efforts are gonna be for actual in school or for, for virtual school, providing promotional materials for those types of things. Uh, we've been working with Adept Marketing, um, 
have to give a little bit of credit here to to county commission they did a great job in expanding the contract of the debt marketing as we talked about our budget having a little bit of a gap there the county commission went through and made sure that they extended that contract and found the funds for it we're looking at high density area door hangers so we're going to focus in mm -hmm. on high density areas inside of low response tracks and get information out to them. Uh, we realize there might be some HOAs and CAs that aren't uh, very good with door hangers. So we'll work with different types of promotional materials inside of those communities. Uh, we would also like to move into phase three, reschedule our library panel discussion. That's uh, city staff, census bureau staff and library staff uh, getting together and providing a discussion for community residents. Uh, same thing with independent living communities, uh, get inside of those, do a presentation, demonstration, provide materials, get them set up to go. Uh, event participation is still on hold. There was plans for that. We're kind of waiting to see where that goes. We're looking at preschool promotional items when preschools get back up and running. Uh, under five is a huge group that's undercounted. So getting into that is gonna be a big deal for us. Um, the pop-up party for the community. I thought I took that off of there. We're not 100% sure we're gonna be able to get to that. But uh, moving on, uh, next. Uh, budget today is slightly less than what I was hoping to at this point. We've spent $10,303. Granted, we haven't been able to do the engagement that we really wanted to. So it's been purchasing signs and materials and things along those lines to get information out. Uh, we would have rather had a whole lot more engagement. We do have plans for funds. And we'll go to the last slide. Got some links up there for anybody that hasn't completed their census or you encounter anybody that still needs to get it done. Fastest, easiest way is my2020census.gov. The middle slide there is the response rate map. If you wanna keep track of what Coral Springs is doing, what the particular tracks are doing, what the state, what the national response is, it's all there. And then the final link is a link that'll take you to what the operational adjustments are. They change quite often. So if you do have questions about it, if you don't want to try and stay on top of it, just go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll get you everything through there. The one last thing that I wanted to point out is how well our state is doing. Overall, when we get into it, the response rate for the state of Florida is at ranked at about 31st. 30 other states have a higher response rate. But when we get into the raw numbers, Florida's had 5.9 million responses so far, which puts us in third as far as the overall number of people who have responded to the census, which is critical because that's how we do the apportionment for representatives. Uh, Texas is ahead of us at 6.6 .6 million. California is closing in on 10. So there is a chance to still go ahead and be the second most populous state according to census numbers. Not likely, but possible. Three is a very strong possibility. New York has just over 5 million. So as far as getting those funds that are apportioned to the state and getting extra representation and house representatives, those are both looking like strong opportunities for Florida. Awesome. Well, Alex, I love how driven you are. I love all the details. Uh, you guys are working very, very hard and it looks like so far our numbers are good and always room for improvement, uh, but definitely keep up the good work. And uh, I know all of us will be pushing it too. I'll keep pushing it. Uh, I'm gonna start this time with Commissioner Simmons and then Commissioner Vignola. Uh, no questions, um, just really, really good presentation. Thank you for all the efforts. Uh, you know, sorry, you know, you aren't not gonna have the budget you're gonna, you, you would like, but that just means you get to be as creative as you need to be uh, to get, you know, to reach your goals. All right, so that's it. Thank you, Commissioner Vignola. No comment. Great. Vice Mayor Carter and then Commissioner Sarah. So at the food drive on Tuesday, my one of my, my first job was milk, but then my last job was to put the flyers in the cars and I had the card for the census. And so I thought I'm not wasting an opportunity. So every car that I put that in there that I could talk to them, I said, please fill out your census. And I can't tell you how many of them said they did. And I said, oh, thank you so much for supporting your city. So. Yes, and Vice Mayor Carter was wearing her census shirt at the last few <laughs> drive too. So, great, wonderful, I'm Commissioner Sarah. I'm going to try to say this with a straight face, but is there anything you're not doing? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, we're doing a lot. We're doing a lot and we're getting a lot of help from everybody. Communications and marketing is doing a lot. You know, it's again, you know, kind of just like the la uh, previous Alex's uh, thing. There's so much teamwork and, and it really has been. And I'm really fortunate and, and grateful to work for the organization that I do for having the leadership that we do, you know, from all of our directors and assistant directors to our city manager's office and, and our commission. Uh, it's, it's been a really, it's a weird to say, uh, this pandemic has been absolutely amazing. Just, just to see the effort and everything that's come through from our team. It's really refreshing. Yeah. I was you know, Alex, I'm, you know, I'm so glad you said that because you remind me, uh, and we probably all feel this way when when we're out there at the uh, food drive it, it's a it's a very hard feeling to explain the sense of community the sense of giving the teamwork uh and and the gratitude that we have to be able to be there to share and give to the community uh through and with feeding south florida uh, it's been a been a privilege to be a part of such an amazing team with such great hearts and you know Alex and David taking care of the logistics. Uh, gosh, it's incredible. So you, we could probably do. Ryan could probably win another Emmy uh, about how the food drives have been going. Do you agree, Sean? Yeah, I have to say, Alex, I was joking with my question, but you you killed it. And as far as uh, you know, you mentioned it, the other Alex's, I don't know if the commission knows, but we had a run of Alex's there. So if there's anyone that's an outside Alex, if you're innovating and you know, you're talented, Coral Springs is the place to be because <laughs> where all the top Alex's are. So great job. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll give it over to you, Frank. All right. Uh, Alex, thank you for all your hard work. You're doing a great job. And Mayor, just for the record, Ryan could win an Emmy for just about anything. So, <laughs> um, Mayor, I would like to go out of order. Uh, Catherine can do the cow uh, overview at our commission meeting under uh, manager's comments uh, so we can handle that then as well as the Everglades strategy. But it is important we talk about Cypress Park real quick. Um, so I'm going to ask Rob to, to, uh, to come up and, and do that presentation. Uh, just some background, uh, you know, Cypress Park has has had has some issues with basket with the basketball courts over there, and we being so close to the the uh, uh, playground, and we we've taken some actions. We have we have uh, an opportunity to uh, expand some of our uh, other facilities uh, with the courts over there. So Rob would like to just tell you guys a little bit about that and and see what the will of the commission is. Sounds good. Welcome, Rob, and welcome to your new position. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get started by just uh, the idea of, of how this came about. And I, I've been challenging staff, the Parks and Rec staff, um, pretty much to come up with new and creative and innovative ideas of how, how to make parks better, uh, how to make improvements to them, how to solve some issues that we may have in some of the parks. Uh, some of them are financial and sustainability, and, and some of them are just like what Frank just said here, some of the issues that we have here at the park. So uh, the idea came about because uh, we're installing new pickleball courts out at the tennis center, and we have a constant uh, problem <laughs> with basketball um, out, out at Cypress Park. Um, some of the um, problems that we have are, are they're running games out there. There's alcohol issue. Um, there's uh, always a smell of marijuana if you're ever there in the evenings. Um, we've, we've tried ways uh, from the information from the staff. This has been going on for the past three years. As a matter of fact, three years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, under three uh, years ago, uh, there's actually been a brawl at, at, at the basketball courts there because they were running games and whatever the exchange of money and information was going on at that time, uh, there was a big brawl. It's actually hosted, which is a bad uh, image for us at City of Coral Springs, on worldstarhiphop.com. Uh, so it was videoed by one of the other um, basketball uh, players, um, and, it, and then they posted it. So uh, we, we received, so those are some of the issues that came up with the idea for us to change the Cypress courts uh, into pickleball courts for multiple reasons. But the complaints that we have been getting just so you know why we came up with the idea were because of you know phone calls we're averaging at least two phone calls a month of, of, of the pr 
profanity, the, the, the screaming, the yelling, the smell, because it is less than 75 feet away from the uh, playground. Uh, across the canal, um, uh, the neighbors call all the time via email, uh, walk-ups. We get walk-ups going, hey, can you calm these people down to our staff at the park? So we go over there, we address the situation. So going back three years, when, it's, when a lot of this has started, um, we've decided to put in palm trees to try to separate the, the, the playground from the basketball courts. Well, that didn't work. So we said, how can we even get more distancing so they don't run games? So they took the full courts uh, on the north side of, of, the, uh, of the basketball courts and we took those and made them half courts. And that didn't work. Signs posted. We posted signs up all over the place. Watch your profanity. Watch, watch your language. Uh, please clean this up. Uh, all, all different types of scenario, scenarios there. So we've made the attempt to do it. Uh, they quit for a little while. The basketball players will quit that for a little while, respect it for a little while, and then it always comes back uh, to the same thing. The loud noise, the profanity, um, the smell of, of weed and, and that at the facilities. So the reason, uh, the solution that came up with, with staff was why, why don't we use something to alleviate that problem um, and come up with an idea for new and innovative creative ideas for that facility. And we came up with, if we can expand through, uh, we got, we got uh, measurements out and lined everything and figured it all out, that we can get eight pickleball courts there, uh, resurfaced under lights. Um, and that would give us um, 14 total pickleball courts. Why is that number important? That, that number of pickleball courts is important because according to the CVB, we have enough, you have a minimum of 12. We can bring it, we can start bringing in some tournaments, pickleball tournaments. And that ends up helping with our, uh, um, you know, the economic impact and, and, and the revenues and memberships for, for uh, the tennis center, which because we added pickleball over there also. So what do we do with the basketball players? So the basketball players still have, uh, we have 31 and a half courts um, out there throughout the city. Um, so we would take that down they would only lose the three, uh, uh, four and a half courts, uh, it's early two and a half courts, three, if you count the two halves. So three full courts out there still provides them with 28 and a half courts to play. And I got 15 right now that all have lights. So they can still play at, at Mullins. They can still, and still play at Sportsplex. There's five lit courts at Mullins. There's four, uh, at Sportsplex, um, two and a half courts at NCP. We have two lit courts at Betty Stradling and we have one and a half courts at Riverside. Um, so there's still places for the basketball players to play. So we alleviate a problem, we create new opportunity. Um, and I think it would be a win-win for everybody. Where does the funding come from? We had a little money left over from capital projects to uh, uh, do this project. Um, it came in just under um, $50,000 and we, we it's, that puts the courts down, surfaces, lights, and it does all the windscreen uh, all around it so, so we can actually enclose it in there. And it also it installs a water fountain into there also. So what are our options um, out there uh, with the residents and the complaints and the complaints not only from the residents, but the playground and moms and dads over there about everything. Uh, we can leave it as is, um, which we don't, you know, that option uh, I don't like only for the fact of, of the inconvenience that has been put on the residents and the people at the playground. Option two, we, we can try to put in, um, just use the northern side of the courts and, and just put pickleball courts in there and leave the basketball courts on the, on the southern end there and try to create more distance between the playground and the basketball courts. Uh, the fear there to me uh, personally would be if uh, pickleball people want to play at the same time, basketball players, and they still consider swearing and everything else, then that's going to may deter the pickleball players from wanting to come out and use the facilities. Um, and lastly, we can go uh, with this plan um, and, and, and I guide the uh, basketball players to the other facilities and also uh, put the new pickleball courts in uh, and, and create a, uh, give us a better chance to host events, increase the pickleball membership numbers. And uh, also a game out there is, that you use on pickleball courts is uh, soccer tennis. You can also play soccer tennis 
uh, on those courts. So it would give us another uh, opportunity to, to promote another sport. Um, if you're not familiar with soccer, tennis, it's uh, pretty much you play tennis with your foot in a soccer ball. You just uh, kick it over and back and forth. Other than that. So it's good footwork. Um, huh. Never yeah. heard of it. Yep. It's called soccer tennis. So um, I just wanted to bring this to you guys and give you the option, uh, the commission and give you the options uh, and any feedback that you have and uh, see if we have your blessings to move forward with the project. I'm going to go to Commissioner Vignola first, our park commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Look, I, you know, the, the Cypress Park uh, basketball courts have been an issue for us in the city going back to when, I mean, I, even when I was in high school. Uh, I know Rick tried hard to eliminate some of the issues over there and some of the hedges and things in between. Unfortunately, that issue is not going away. Uh, we have in the area uh, uh, over in the sports complex, my glaze for, for basketball that tends to be kind of open. That's where I play a lot. Um, and you don't have to worry about being so close to the young kids and stuff. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm okay with that. I love the idea of, like Rob saying, some other things. I mean, soccer, tennis is a big in my house, especially with the whole quarantine situation and everything that, that's taking place. We play soccer, tennis in our backyard and our patio almost every single day. And it's something that is actually really popular. I think as Inter Miami picks up, um, it's going to become more popular. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it, it, we have to do something here. And uh, I think Rob's kind of kind of nailed it. So. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Vice Mayor Carter. Oh, option three, please, please, please. I just, I am so excited about having more pickleball courts. You know, I love to play. I was beside myself today when uh, Manager Babinek said singles could play. <laughs> I quickly text, did you say singles could play for pickleball? Because that is just a great sport. I can't tell you that they never swear, but it would never be as bad as basketball. I can assure you of that. So, We've yeah, We've so. also found out that through the CVB, um, to elaborate on it, that if, if, you know, with all those courts outdoors and ones that we could put indoors, up to 12 courts indoors, they can get us at least 150 team pickleball tournament. And they oh, wow. Fund it. And they, they're they said, if we, if we can follow through with this project or whatever and, and still use our gymnasium with the courts inside and outside, uh, they said we can, we can pull a pretty large pickleball tournament with that. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate right. the creativity right. and a, it's a great idea. Option three for me. Commissioner Sarah and then Commissioner Simmons. Yeah, I echo. Uh, let me, I'm having some technical difficulty here. I echo uh, Vice Mayor Carter and uh, Commissioner Vignola. You're doing a great job. I love the vision and passion, and you did a really good job on the conference call this afternoon. And uh, it uh, definitely is really, really noticed on my end, but on others that uh, you're leading away in just a short period of time. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> That's awesome. That's awesome. And Commissioner Simmons. Hey, thanks, uh, Rob. I know everyone, I know you're doing the, the best job you can in trying to make sure you satisfy everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you all are aware, um, but there an, a petition was actually sent to me um, about saving the basketball courts. I don't know why this particular court is the, the popular outdoor, um, you know, outdoor basketball court, um, you know, and I hate that that, you know, design, you know, I don't know why you would put a basketball court so close to, um, so close to a playground. I mean, if anyone's ever in, in, in on this meeting played basketball, you know, things get a little heated. Uh, and yeah. so, um, you know, uh, it's just interesting that you would put, you know, basketball court so close to, um, so close to uh, a playground. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this because I knew this is going to come up. Um, you know, I don't know if there is a place where we can in that park, because it's a pretty large park, um, uh, where we could put maybe like a, a just a singular, you know, one court, uh, you know, and I don't know, figure something out. I just, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to inconvenience uh, people that actually use the court and aren't uh, violating the rules or anything like that, because obviously if they're putting a petition together, these are probably not the folks that are uh, violating uh, the rules. Um, you know, it's cool. You, you know, you all want to you know put in pickleball courts and all this stuff like that. I just... 
you know, there are concerned citizens and concerned residents that, you know, would hate to see that basketball court go. So. I'll yeah, go. I understand. And uh, to elaborate a little bit on that, um, I did try to do some research on that. I'm, I am aware of, of the uh, petition that was out there. And we have staff members that have also played in that group throughout the course of the years. Mm. We're finding out that, that they've left for those reasons, some of those reasons I just told you. And uh, um, most of, from the reporting uh, three years ago, most of them, over half, they said, were not even Coral Springs residents. And the petition started by a guy named Jamal Waring, who is not even a Coral Springs residence. He's, he, he lives in Miami. So I couldn't find the results of how many people on his petition were Coral Springs residents. You know, so I was just trying to gather as much information as I possibly could to find out if that group, that large of a group in that petition was Coral Springs residents. And from the staff uh, who have played there and the staff in the evenings who work there, uh, they're pretty confident that less than half uh, are Coral Springs uh, residents, more than half uh, coming from outside the area. Not that that's a big issue, um, we do welcome people when they come over to play to use our facilities, but that's all the uh, research I could find for that. Well, I appreciate that response. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, this is not a, a, a hill I'm planning to die on, you know, uh, yeah. uh, for that. I just want to make sure those facts are out there. And I guess in the, the climate that we're in right now with all the things that have been happening nationally, I want to make sure that, um, you know, obviously playing basketball, it's probably going to be a good chunk of, black people playing, and I'm not trying to make this a race issue, but I just want to make sure that when those complaints and things are coming in, especially as, you know, maybe people are going to be playing a different course throughout the city, that those complaints aren't coming off of, uh, coming from biases or anything like that. I mean, people are going to cuss playing basketball, man. And, you know, um, people playing ball might have a different vernacular than some than what someone else is used to or something like that. So I just want to make sure we're mindful of that. That's all. Yeah, We run games too. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> Yeah, you can go ahead, Commissioner Vignola, and then we'll hear from you, Frank. Anyway, I, I just, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the Cypress course has, has been, and like has always been, it's a place if you get a good group of guys together and you want to go around and put the money down on games. And so things get heated there really quick. Um, and then it, it creates a lot of issues. And then, it's not just a Coral Springs resident thing that a lot of the things that I've heard from Coral Springs residents about those courses, we just shy away from that. It's just, you know, it, it, it's a little bit more serious than a regular group of people getting together to play ball. Gotcha. Frank? And, and Commissioner Simmons, to your point of we can look into possibly a different location in Cypress Park. Um, if this is something we move forward with during our strategic planning uh, beginning of next year, if, if that is the will of the commission, we can always do that. And, and that would be obviously contingent on funding um, for a future project. Uh, so that always is an option. But unfortunately, and this was a question you know I had early on, unfortunately, we just don't have the money right now to move the uh, basketball court and or the playground. Um, so repurposing that, uh, was, was the option that the parks director came up with. Hey, listen, I'm not, I'm not fighting anyone on this. I just, you know, let me no, I know. hear you. I hear you. Hey, you know, I, I hope we have a world famous pickleball tournament. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you out there playing. I challenge you. <laughs> I, I think I need uh, to go how to play pickleball or something. So. I got to learn how to play. I look forward to it. And I, Rob, I think your ideas that you and the team came up with are great. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to mitigate some aspect of our city we don't want to reinforce. Uh, and at the same time, you know, in, engage our citizenry that support pickleball, want pickleball, and hopefully, you know, it may be a revenue source for us. I, I wouldn't be surprised down the road. So thank you very much, Rob. Uh, thank you, team. It is 8.04. Frank, I'm going to hand it back to you for, you know, uh, we promised 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm ready to wrap up. I don't need to make any comments myself. So, Mayor, I do, I do, we need to do, cover two things real quick. Uh, one is we can, we can wait till the commission meeting, but the commission is going to need to take action for the July 1st meeting if you guys choose to cancel it. 
So we'll make sure that that makes it on the agenda for the meeting on, on June 3rd. The other was uh, our meeting on June 30. There, there is a charter school board meeting and then there is a commission meeting. And I believe it's Coral Springs High School's graduation parade is that morning. Um, and a couple of the commissioners had asked about possibly attending the parade. Uh, I did check with uh, uh, John and we, we don't we don't have enough time to cancel or move the meeting for for uh, um, um, advertising purposes. So I, I just want to let the commission know that I understand that the parade is happening, but we also have a commission meeting that morning that's already been pre-scheduled. So uh, I just want the commission to be aware of that. Correct. You, you'd actually have to cancel a meeting at a meeting <clears throat> where you voted to uh, to cancel or, or to or to, to to move it to another date. And obviously, you can't vote at a workshop. So that gotcha. meeting, yeah, so that meeting is is going to go forward unless somehow we don't have a quorum, and, and hopefully we will have a quorum. And so, just so that I'm clear, from what time to what time is the Coral Springs High School parade? Um. Chief Perry, do you have that information? Or Sean, did you? Nine, nine to 11. Nine to 11. Well, it's on our calendars from nine to 11. Yes, it's nine to 11. Uh, they're setting up out there at seven o'clock. Uh, so uh, those the people will start getting lining up about 7.30 and the, and the, uh, the drive-through will start at about nine o'clock. They're hoping to have it wrapped up by 10.30 and cleaned up by 11. And where does the parade begin, Rob? They're stationed in the cars inside the Tom Messenheimer Festival Field, and they're going to bring them back out and around. Um, and they're going to go in front of the stage. And after they go in front of the stage, which is right in front of the entrance of the uh, tennis uh, complex, uh, tennis center, and then they'll just keep going out sportsplex out to sample and then go on their way. But they'll have a stage and they'll have principals. And I don't know what their ceremony is going to be, but they'll have a speaker there as, as the cars drive by. They'll be making uh, announcements. Gotcha. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question? By all means. Uh, Frank or John, um, on that particular date, I know it's publicly noticed. Could we adjust the time if the commission um, approves it or something? Because in my opinion, and this is just me, but um, I think it's important for our city leadership if they're available to be at that event just because, you know, our seniors have lost a lot. So <clears throat> is it possible to move the date or not the date, but the time? And would the commission be open to that? So what you could do is open the meeting at nine and now you have a meeting. And if you want to adjourn the meeting and continue it at a time certain the same day, at least the public's there at nine expecting the meeting, we could hopefully, uh, you know, on the, on the Zoom meeting, maybe say, you know, continue it until 1030 or 10 or whatever you're thinking of doing. So the best thing to do is, and remember, since we're meeting virtually, you could call in from there on Zoom <laughs> and you could start the meeting at nine. We need to start, in my opinion, we need to start that meeting at nine. And, and then this could be a point of order and, and we can announce um, that we're continuing it to a time certain. Um, and maybe, um, I know we got uh, from, from Rob that it might, it should be over about 1030. Maybe we can tighten exactly when it's going to be over and then you could adjourn, adjourn it to the time certain of 10.30, let's say. And then uh, if anyone came in Zoom, I'd like to have something up that says meeting will be uh, reopened at 10.30. If that's the, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the time. If that commission agree, if the commission agrees to that, then you can reopen it at 10.30. But we need to start at nine because that's when we said we're starting it and you can't take any action at a uh, workshop. I, I, think we, I think we have a vision um, and uh, I plan to uh, follow your wisdom, John, and we will start the meeting at nine um, and we'll take it from there. And I, I'm glad, Frank, that you shared with the concerns of the commissioners. If I can be at that parade, I want to be there. So that, that's a good way of uh, handling that conflict. Yep, that can be very good. I mean, that's the school I teach at. So I was going to be there regardless. And I was already going to call in from there. So glad uh, that my, my plans were confirmed. <laughs> Good to hear, Commissioner. Good to hear. Now, now uh, interestingly enough, um, this is usually never the problem at a commission meeting when you're supposed to be together. Now that we're virtual, 
if we do happen to have that meeting at some level <laughs> each other while we're having the meeting, which is the opposite of all meetings in the history of the world. For sure. Let's be virtual, don't be together physically. I, I'm just practice I'm social just, distancing. Exactly. <laughs> Understood. Uh, is it okay with the team that we adjourn at this point? Okay. Yeah, it looks like I have a cent. So uh, it, it's uh, eight ten. Thanks everybody for staying on a little bit later. Uh, you know, uh, thank you. Yes, Commissioner. I got I got one more thing regarding our meeting on uh, next week. Okay. We have a school board meeting scheduled before that. Correct. Is it too late to move that meeting also? Yes. Um, because there's no action you can take right now. Um, I mean, I think the eight o'clock. Well, I mean, so. The eight o'clock is that you can be appearing by phone. You could, you could at eight, we could move it, but, but ideally. Here's kind of my question. That we, so our commission meetings are set. Our school board meetings aren't set by charter or anything else, right? I mean, can we just not call the meeting that day? Well, right. It doesn't have the same, um, it's, it's not in your charter how to do it. Although we've posted the meeting is going to start at eight. So um, you can't take an action because that's also a public board. Um, but that, it, the same time restraint shouldn't exist, right, John? Yeah, right. That's what I was thinking since you, were gonna, you can be virtually there. Um, but if you want at eight o'clock, you could, you could decide to move that to a, forward to the next week to another time, whatever you want to do, you can do that. But I would suggest you open up that meeting at eight because it's posted at eight. You can't take action today. So my, that would be my recommendation. And if you don't want to have that meeting at eight, and I don't know what, what, what's on there right now offhand, Deborah May, but the urgency of it, Frank, I don't know um, if there is an urgency for that meeting. I would ask either Deb or Melissa to. It does start at 8.30 a.m. And there are items that will need to be heard because it is at the end of the school year. Gotcha. Understood. So, so I would open so my kind of question is does the commission want to open and close that meeting or go forward to the eight thirty. That okay if we address that now, John? Well you can address it now, but you're gonna open it at eight thirty either way, and then you can have that discussion to continue it. But you can talk about it now as well, but the action would have to be at that eight thirty. I mean it might for best practice, it's it's not in our charter. Um because when we did our charter, we didn't have, you were not members of a, of a charter school board. But I would recommend, since people will be tuning in, that if they tune in at 830, you would, you would start your meeting, discuss that you're about to go to this graduation for the charter school, or I guess this is for, for actually the-, the Coral Springs. Side. But nevertheless, and because of that, you wanna continue that for the date certain of, 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 of a week from that day at 830, whatever time you are gonna do it, I'd rather you do that in your board meeting at 830, and all you, you can call in Zoom by phone. So I, I think it's doable. I'm going to muddle things a little bit. It's actually 8.15 a.m. that it begins, okay? 8.15. Okay. That, that sounds even better, Deborah. <laughs> uh, and you know, I'm looking around the, the room. Uh, I think you'll get what you're looking for, Larry. The only reason why I'm asking is that I think it makes a difference to the school board, I mean, to the charter school staff. How we're going to handle this moving forward. If we can give them a heads up on hey, we're going to go or not go, would be, I think, beneficial for them. So you can't vote right now, but if you want to indicate that that's your intention as a as a commission, is that is to, is to move that meeting at eight fifteen, we would looking for consensus type of thing. Yeah, if, if there's consensus on that, that that it won't be going forward the full meeting, then we could give uh, the heads up to uh, charter school staff. I like it. All right, Commissioner Simmons likes it. Commissioner Sarah is shaking his head. Yes. Vice okay. Mayor Carter, sound agreeable? Yes. Another head shake. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Commissioner Vignola. Uh, Thank you. Any, any final comments, thoughts? So just uh, I'll end again. Uh, thank you to the team. Fantastic workshop. Um, you guys are doing a phenomenal job and you've taken it to another level during the pandemic and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We're adjourned. Have a good evening. Stay safe, everyone. You too.